All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Committee of the Whole meeting on, when, on Monday, October the 19th. I uh, just want to start by acknowledging that we're having this meeting on the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees in the Esquimalt First Nations, and that their connections to this land continues to this day. I also want to let everybody know, it's a small audience here, but those at home, this is uh, being live streamed if you're watching it, but it's also available for later watching uh, through our website. Um, we have an agenda in front of us here today, and the first item on the agenda, I'll just actually remind people as well, we are meeting as Committee of the Whole today, so this is a less formal uh, gathering of council. We're not making decisions here today, but it gives us a chance in a more informal capacity to discuss and tease out some of the, uh, the nuances of some of the items coming to council. Uh, it also allows for the public input, so all of the items on the agenda allow for public input. And you can call in to the 250-598-3311 number uh, to provide any input on any of the items. Uh, if you call in, you'll be put into a queue. Uh, I don't expect it'll be busy, but if it is, you can just call back again, uh, and we'll just manage that queue as it comes in. That, that number again, it's on the agenda, 250-598-3311. Uh, item, uh, first item on the agenda is uh, a consideration of an anonymous donation to public art. Uh, we have the uh, artist Kent Laforme here with us to answer questions. Um, and um, I believe, uh, Mr. Meikle, uh, are you here to, to just to give a quick overview? Uh, oh, hello. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you, Steve. As, yes, sorry, Mr. Meikle, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, sure, yeah. It just uh, came to council last meeting, October 13th, and a uh, donation to place a sculpture featuring Takaya, uh, the uh, island's wolf, I guess you could say, at uh, Cattle Point. And uh, the location at Cattle Point has been um, vetted by uh, our parks manager and uh, Mr. Wiley Thomas and uh, Margaret Lipke and friends of Upland Society, Uplands Park Society, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, is um, I, I just thought I would uh, invite uh, the, the information is essentially here in front of us. The the consideration is whether or not we want to uh, support the location of the artwork there, and then I guess formally request that I go in and speak with the uh, with the donors to see if they would be interested in putting it there. Uh, the offer has not been officially made. This has been a bit of an awkward process uh, through this. Um, but uh, as you can see in the report, for those watching at home, there's been a, a number of early considerations as we looked at this, uh, and we tried our best to address those concerns. And uh, here we are back here again with the, uh, with the potential. So, Mr. Laforme, I thought it would just be worthwhile for people to understand a little bit about, whereas we're considering the location of this art, a little bit of the background, uh, how you got involved and in, in your connection to that location. And, and I know you've been an advocate for that location, although it's ultimately up to the, to the, to the patrons, to the donors, as to, to select. Mm -hmm. Chris Heidley. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to just uh, sure. welcome Mr. Heidley. We've, we've just started, and uh, we've just introduced uh, uh, Mr. Laforme, who's going to give a quick overview. Uh, Mr. Meikle did a, a good job of just giving a quick overview of the... Uh, of the of the background with parks, but it's good to have you here to answer questions. Is there anything you wanted to add before we get going? No, that's uh, that's fine, uh, Your Worship. We're good right now. Okay, thank you very much. So, Mr. Laforme, welcome to Council. Okay, well, and, thank uh, you. Um, yeah, thank you for all meeting with me today. I'm uh, happy to be here to speak, and I'd also like to to respectfully acknowledge the traditional lands of the Lekwungen people and the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, who I'm uh, happy to to be here. Um, the stone and the, the, the sculpture for Takaya is a little bit of a strange um, situation in terms of how it came about. Um, shortly after Takaya was, was shot, I was approached by some people who I'd worked with before in an artistic capacity. I'd done, they were aware of my work um, and my body of work. And they said, what do you think about doing a sculpture to honor honor this special wolf who's so sacred to, to so many people in this part of the world. And my, my initial response was um, a little bit of trepidation. I did want to speak with people who I felt were, were far more invested and aware and had, had sensitivities around the wolf, and I wanted to learn what I could before I, I committed to such a, a big and important project. Um, I was fortunate um, to meet uh, Cheryl Alexander, and she was very helpful. Um, I watched her film, and um, 
course I was aware of, of Takeya and the wolf. He actually, um, when he arrived in 2012, he passed through from Elk Lake uh, on my birthday as he headed down to the islands. And um, not that that matters a whole bunch, but it, it does, uh, is another connection I, I, I feel that, uh, is special for me when I'm working on it. Um, when I went back and talked with the donors about my thoughts, I wanted to make sure they were happy with my concepts and my, my conceptual approach to the project. Um, I told them what I was thinking. They, um, again, liked my idea. I, I told them, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in a, a bronze, like a, a static statue of the wolf, um, I can recommend some really wonderful bronze casters. My approach to it would be to source um, what I refer to as a wild wild type of forest boulder that's indigenous to the land, especially with Cattle Point in mind. I wanted something that um, already existed in the world. And so um, my background as an artist and a marble cover goes back. Um, I lived in Italy for years working as a marble sculptor, and, and I feel fairly informed with marble. But generally, it's always homogenous cut quarry blocks that come from deep below the surface. So what I uh, had discovered here years ago was there are these glacier erratics of marble boulders that are pushed up on the forest floor of the island and have 10,000 years of watermarks. They're stones shaped by wind and water, and they offer a real story of, of time and place. And I thought that was really meaningful in terms of honoring a wolf who hails from the same, same area of the island, uh, potentially of the northwest coast, and, and honor the spirit of a wolf with, with a stone that I already felt had some inherent qualities that um, were connected to these wolf packs that have also been roaming for thousands of years. Um, so they liked my choice of material, it made sense, and um, they kind of gave me artistic license from there in terms of what my thoughts were. I, um, I think I mentioned in the video that was shot for Council when I was uh, down at Cattle Point with my family, there was the communal howl that was um, arranged. So we were there howling, um, sort of all echoing these mournful howls that we'd all become accustomed to from the wolf. And um, you could really feel the wolf's absence. And um, I'm trying, I'm, I'm thinking now not only of the wolf in terms of um, the grief different people are feeling and the belief systems different people have and the associations with the wolf, but, but how do I identify with the wolf and how would I try to, to work with that in a sculpture? And um, something that really struck me was um, just this sense of this void um, and this big, uh, this huge impact the wolf had had in terms of how many people um, this wolf had reached um, and in different ways and capacities, especially after the film went out internationally. And um, his presence was so strong and I kept imagining the wolf still on the archipelago. And so um, that eventually distilled itself down to this sort of what I call a portal or tunnel where people could look through a stone um, because I didn't want you to just look at an object or, you know, I wanted people to try to engage and be able to share their feelings. And somehow um, there's something about the howl of a wolf. It's like um, the sound of rain. It doesn't need an explanation. It doesn't need an introduction. When you hear it, there's a, a feeling that goes with it. And um, I liked doing this tunnel through a stone because it had an acoustic sound to it. And uh, you could howl through it. You could call out to it. And I liked that it had a sound component where initially I was singing my kids. Like, kids could howl. They, you know, they love to scream and shout. But I also thought any age, anyone can, can howl through this or still look through it and have this circular window um, to the world of the wolf and imagine that there was a wolf that lived here. And it's, it's just remarkable because <laughs> these islands are so close to, to Oak Bay and Victoria and the wolf stayed. So that's also, I mean, I, I just think it's unbelievable because it's, it's a pack animal. You know, it's not like um, some other animal. I mean, it would be, I, I don't even know another uh, fitting analogy, but for this, this lone wolf to disperse from his pack, make his way down and come to the islands um, was really incredible. Um, so I know the donors, when we were talking about it, they, they were always sort of fostered and, and believed in the importance for coexistence. So that was definitely thematic too when I was thinking about it in terms of just how much of Canada's wildlife is concentrated in BC, concentrated on Vancouver Island, and um, 
what a special place Cattle Point is. So, I mean, because not only my memories at Cattle Point are strong, but um, all the communities are, it's just, it's a special place. So I, I always in my mind was thinking about that stone being at Cattle Point where people could visit it and see a rock that's really designed to weather with the rest of the natural environment. It's not, it's not meant to be an imposition or visually um, in the way. It, it should become a part of the world just as the, the spirit of the wolf is a part of the world and um, just blend in with the natural world. So people could go there and learn about this wolf, uh, pay their respects to the wolf, read about the wolf. Through this tunnel, um, you'll have a view to, to where the wolf lived. And um, the tunnel also reflects light the way it's finished. So um, aesthetically, I, I like the fact that the, it engages people. It, it's it's um, it's designed as sculpture to, to be touched, to be crawled on, to be held into, and to be interacted with, with the, the rest of the, the natural world there. Um, something I haven't talked about much in the video, because it is a work in progress, so, you know, along with community input, which I, which I really value and feel is a, um, a really important part of this process, um, is, is the idea of story stones. And, and you know, I, I have a lot of... Um, a deep reverence and respect for the, the Songhees connection to Sakaya. And it would be great to have, um, as well as Takea, the shared path that's built on mutual respect and mutual understanding where there is words on about Takea. And, and I would like to have something with the, the work that conservationist Cheryl Gordon did, documenting the wolf's lives and helping share it and raise awareness of the wolf for, for everyone, but also um, not only the local and international relevance of the wolf, but also the, the indigenous spiritual connection. And I'm trying to work with, with a lot of these things right now as it's in progress. Um, again, I think that ties to time and place and uh, the spirit of the wolf. Um, I won't talk for much longer because I, I can go on and on about, about stones and, and wolves, but the stone does have a lot of really beautiful characteristics that are rare, and I've looked at stones and I... You know, for fun, I was a type of person who would go out in the rain to look at rocks as the rain was drying because you could see where the fissures and cracks were when I lived in Italy. And I've looked at a lot of stone in the past 30 years, and it's really rare to find, one, a glacier erratic that's been pushed up to the surface, two, one that has evidence of shifts and earthquakes, but also a color change in the vein. So this stone is extraordinary because it goes from a dark stone to a light stone. Um, so if I think about it like a geological painting that has been happened over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, um, it, it's it's really remarkable. It's it's really an incredible stone. So in a way, it's also a, a monument to the West Coast itself and 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 this part of the world, which I think is is a fitting stone to honor a wolf. And um, from the beginning, I've tried to approach it as as the soul of a wolf, and. Let, let the process inform me as, as I continue on this path. So um, any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Thank you for, for indulging me and, and listening <laughs> and considering it because I, I'm, I'm personally very hopeful that it goes to Cattle Point and um, I'm happy to speak more to that if, if need be. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Mr. Mr. LaForme. And I, it is, our, our decisions here is primarily the, the location, but uh, I think the context the, uh, of your your passion for this is helpful as well. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm so happy with the process that I've seen so far for this piece of art. Um, we've had consultation with First Nations, with um, Friends of Uplands Park, Parks, Rec and Culture, um, the, the Public Arts Committee. We were there the other day, um, and it was great for them to be able to have a look at this piece and see the passion that you bring to the piece as well, um, because I think that's really important. Um, some people say that, uh, that we have a lot of art in Oak Bay already. We have nothing like this. And this is something that's so meaningful. Um, and I think that you touched a little bit on the um, indigenous spirit connection and, and the, the two stones that you hope to have that have words in English. And I think the other words would be um, perhaps from Chief Ron Salmon. Perhaps you can talk about that. Certainly. Um, there's, there's nothing definitive. I have spoke with um, Chief Ron Sam uh, a week ago Friday. And... Um, We've discussed the idea of, of uh, story stones um, for Stakaya and Takea in both English and Lekwungen. 
and that's ongoing right now. I'm not, uh, I don't really know much more than that. I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I think that, that, I think the point is that it's important that, that something like that, that you're actually um, pursuing that, and that I think will mean a lot as well. So, so um, when everybody else has made their comments, I'd be very happy to, to make the motion as it stands. Um, I think we have had some information from people that have a concern um, to be putting a piece of art in this particular location. I think that, again, with all the consultation that we've had with the different groups that are involved in that area, I feel very comfortable with it going in the location that, um, that we have uh, before us. Okay, could I add a little bit to that? Um, you may. Certainly, thank you. <laughs> certainly, as the artist approaching it, the last thing I would want to do would be to try to advocate to plunk down a, a, a sculpture or a piece of art um, anywhere that uh, hadn't done due diligence to make sure that it wasn't on any uh, red listed flora or fauna. And so I was, it was great to have a site meeting where people who were invested in, in those species came out and sort of pointed around and, and we did identify where invasive species were and where a potential sort of safe spot, so to speak, could go for the, for the stone where, where it wouldn't, wouldn't impact anything like a fern, vernal pool or... So that, that's, also, yeah, that's, that's very important to me as well. Uh, I have, did you, Councilor Green, did you have your hand up? Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, and through you to the mayor, and I will support Councilor Haith, uh, Haithwaite, Braithwaite's, <laughs> sorry, Braithwaite's <laughs> comments. Um, this is a magnificent piece of work, I think, and I, what I like about the location is that it's complementary to uh, the, the origin of, of, of the stone, and so it reflects the West Coast, and, and as much as possible, uh, Cattle Point is a natural setting, uh, you know, as much as possible within an urban setting, so I think, I think they go well together, and I'm very impressed. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I also feel that it would be, in, in my mind, strange if this if this sculpture was somewhere else, because in a sense, you think the wolf chose here, the wolf came this way. Um, so I think it also makes sense that that uh, there would be something where the wolf lived to honor the wolf. Thank. Uh, Go ahead, Council. And I'll try and get to questions as much as possible yeah. just because I want to have questions from the public as well or comments from the public. And we can come back to this table for discussion. Uh, Councillor Zalka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, my compliments, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, to the district, to the artist, uh, to Parks and Rec on the process and involving uh, the public so much in this whole process. It's very, um, uh, it, it's wonderful to see um, some of the, the, the I, IAP2 framework, uh, the engagement process coming through. Uh, and knowing that the public has a, has a, has a full involvement in this, so I very much appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I wish to speak in favor in general uh, of, of the process, but I do want to ask uh, one question. <clears throat> it's currently uh, intended to be in a fenced-off area that, um, uh, and I see in, in the in the report that uh, as part of the process of, of locating the artwork uh, at cattle at uh, at. Uh, a cattle point is to uh, r uh, restore uh, an area that currently is it has invasive weeds. Um, because, I, I've, as I've heard, it's going to be have an interactive. It's going to be engaging the public. There's a, it's ex expected to be crawled upon and looked through um, an echo hole, hole, those sort of things. Is it intended um, that the fenced off portion will be moved to allow this piece of artwork to be not fenced off? Yeah, and I'll, I'll put that question to Mr. Hydley. I think that's uh, most appropriate. You were down there for the uh, site meeting, Mr. Hydley. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about, th that's a fairly large fence stop area currently. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about that area and, and what you would hope to see. Yeah, uh, thank you, Your Worship. And Councillor Zelka, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. We can. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so the area that uh, uh, the art is, is to be placed uh, is in currently in a, 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 an area that's uh, corralled off with the split rail fence. The split rail fence was initially installed there just to contain carpet burrweed, which is one of the invasive plants that we try to manage down at, uh, at Cattle Point and uh, at parts of Uplands. Uh, it uh, is relatively simple to uh, realign the, the split rail and uh, the plan is to begin some restoration work in that area, and uh, we could place the art there quite successfully uh, for all to see, just with some modification to the site. 
that would not be impactful. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, Councillor Appleton, the Councillor Nay. Oh, thank you, Worship, and through you. Um, Mr. LaForme, thank you for coming tonight. Um, you mentioned that when you had been approached by the donors to design the sculpture that um, you felt that you had to reach out to certain parties to, to gain uh, context for that work, and I apologize, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, did you reach out to uh, the Songhees Nation at that time? And I'd just like to get more of a, in, just in, in more detail, what the nature of the conversations with the, with the Songhees have been. Okay. Um, when, yeah, I wanted to try to gain more, more context and understanding and, and just do my own, my own research as well to learn, learn more of what I could. And uh, at that time, um, there was a, in the form of emails that went out to Cheryl Alexander and um, Chief Ron Sam. And Cheryl responded and met with me and I spoke with her and, and um, she was really helpful. Um, I didn't hear from Chief Ron Sam. I followed up again, there were a few emails in June, then again in August. And then we finally had a chance to talk uh, a week ago last Friday. And that's, that's again, I'm, I'm, I was trying, I've talked with other people, um, but I was trying to go by protocol through the chief um, because I realized there's, there's enormous, um, the wolf is sacred. And um, I didn't want to start, you know, if someone said to me, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to go through the chief on this because this is a work in progress. I don't know where it's going. Um, I've been approached to do, do a sculpture that honors this wolf. Um, the wolf has, is revered through different lenses um, by different people. And I certainly didn't want to go down a path where I felt that I was um, doing a disservice to, to anyone, really. Yet at the same time, it's hard with a work in progress to um, ensure that you're doing everything um, that can be done if dialogue isn't always um, available. So I'm really grateful that it is right now. And... Um, I'm hopeful that uh, it continues. And uh, it's, it's something I'll advocate um, passionately for. Thank you, thank you Councillor Nee. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, I just, uh, uh, as with other comments already made, this is, uh, this is a, a terrific project. And I, I think we're really fortunate to have um, local artists, local filmmakers uh, to, to, to get behind this and um, do such a high quality piece of work um, um, collectively. So um, I, I, I think that we're very, very fortunate and, and, and I do concur with other comments that this process has been uh, exemplary. And uh, I think the final result will will um, uh, bear, uh, be um, supportive of that. The, the question I have is uh, there was a letter uh, writer who was concerned about the Uplands Park. And so I just wanted to ask Mr. Uh, Hydeley just one more question, Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, of just to provide a little bit more clarification for the public because there was some concern about um, sort of, you know, very likely this will be a feature piece of artwork that people will want to to visit and there'll be photo ops for sure um, because of the location and the, the kind and the story and everything else. And so I just wanted Mr. Hydeley to, if he could share, because I know there has been some thinking about other things down at Cattle, uh, other initiatives at the, the park uh, that would protect some of the uh, vernal pools and other uh, protected species. So uh, the concern by the letter writer has been that because of the success of this project, it is likely to increase traffic at the park and that that would be a, a concern. I'm wondering if you could just speak to some of the ideas that you have in mind that would assure the public that um, the work that has been done would continue to be uh, sustained. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ney. Uh, Mr. Heidley? Uh, thank you, Worship, and Councillor Ney. 
Uh, well, current, currently we do have a uh, management plan and an invasive uh, plant management plan, uh, both ongoing, uh, that I'm uh, working with with uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, but what I'd say about Cattle Point is, is certainly it's one of the best places to enjoy the outdoors, and, and it does have a remarkable uh, diversity of, of flora and, and fauna there. Uh, last year, we did uh, cordon off uh, one of the areas uh, very successfully and uh, saw uh, some, a pretty good bounce back in regards to uh, you know, some, of the, some of the plants. Um, it is busy uh, anyway, Cattle Point, and, and this is where the, the management plan does come in. Um, it, you know, it's a scenic, uh, scenic drive. It's got a very large parking lot. Uh, there's kiosks down there, uh, picnic tables, uh, benches, uh, there's a, a portable toilet. Uh, the area that we have selected uh, doesn't have any of the rare and endangered plants. And uh, from my perspective, uh, it, it may, people will stop and certainly view the yard and, and they may not walk out into the meadows, but we do hope to cordon those off. I know that the tour buses are concerned. Uh, with Mr. Thomas and myself, we've been working on literature to give them uh, this year in regards to uh, respecting the, the vernal pools in the maritime meadows down at the park. We haven't had to hand them out just because there's no tour bus th traffic this year. So we are looking at various ways to manage uh, the, the traffic uh, down there be uh, by eventually beginning to delineate trails. So this piece of art, from our perspective, would fit in quite nicely to the overall plan uh, down at Cattle Point, and I think that it could be incorporated quite successfully. Go ahead, Councilor Ney. Thank you, Mr. Hydley. And then uh, one other, that's very helpful, um, and uh, I think it, it uh, really gives us all confidence that that area is going to be compliant with the management plan and continues to be protected in spite of the increased traffic. So thank you for that, Mr. Heidelay. Second question is, and I may have missed this in the overview, but um, the clip that was uh, produced and uh, so quickly, by the way, uh, it was uh, remarkable how quickly um, the team came together. Cheryl Alexander found a filmmaker and, and put that clip together and uh, it really, did a very nice job in a very succinct way of describing what the project was and provided a really nice invitation to the public to participate and have input into um, the um, the meaning that the that the story had for them to to benefit um, um, uh, Mr. Laform. So the question I have is, what happened with all that information? How did it get compiled? I don't know who, who, how that happened. I, has it all come to you, Mr. Laform, or did it go through? I was just wondering how that piece got compiled and then to you and then what you've done with it, like not specifically around the art, but you, you mentioned that it has been helpful. I'm just wondering, if there's two parts to the question. One is, how did it get to you, and then what did you do with it? So I can okay. tell you how it gets to him. Basically, it comes into our just it's just a uh, an upload piece that comes to on our on our site. So that was set up quickly, and and mm -hmm. Haley just forwards over the um, the materials to Mr. Laform. I guess every few days, and uh, there's a I just should let you know uh, that there's uh, all the schools uh, in the in the region uh, are all taking this up as well for the students. Um, uh, so I don't know if we, I don't have my, my version of it here, but uh, mm -hmm. over a number of years, Mr. Laform has actually gone into the like, elementary schools and taught stone carving using little uh, soapstone wools as a, as a sample. And I have a couple at home for my kids, as it turns <laughs> out. I didn't make the connection until quite a bit later. Um, but that connection, I mean, most of the school children in Oak Bay and, and, and uh, Margaret Jenkins is included as well, uh, are all going to be just uh, allowing their students to share. You think most of their lives, the majority of their lives, have spent with a wolf in, the, in nearby, right? So they've got a pretty close connection. So just in terms of engagement, how much engagement was there? Like, do we have numbers of people who responded to that um, video? Ms. Varela, do you, do you have the numbers yet? It's, it's, not, com it's not done yet, that's all. I oh, think it's yeah. not completed oh, yet. I we're see. still, working, we're oh, still getting that in. Uh, Your Worship, uh, that site is still live and comments are still coming in. They are being forwarded in a timely manner 
uh, to Mr. Laforme when they become available, but those numbers will be reported out when we're finalized. When are we going to close that down? I'm not sure that's been entirely determined. I think uh, certainly to the end of this week, uh, and then I think uh, we'll have to see how it goes. It's it's uh, I think it's up to Mr. Laform when when he can uh, when he gets to that piece and what he can what he can take in. Mr. Laform, anything to add to that? Um, mm -hmm. um, what I've gotten so far is first of all I just read it and um, and uh, you know I take everybody's feedback. Um, really seriously in terms of how I can try to represent it and um, try to treat this as a collective piece of work and um, have it not be you know, didactic purely from my perspective. So um, again, from the onset, um, um, as you mentioned, Councillor, I, I tried to provide context for myself and, and talk to different people and, and obviously two of the two, two really key people, um, Shell Alexander was was one who'd done so much work and had such a, a strong relationship with the Wolf. And again, um, Chief Ron Sam through the song, he's, and I, I do want to just add to, to my conversations with him. Uh, I have said that in, in my opinion, uh, I don't feel that, that anybody can properly honor the Wolf without his voice and without some Lekwungen acknowledgement um, in this part of the world. So I am really hopeful that 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 happens yet again. I don't feel it's my place to take the take the lead on that and and do that. Um, so working with with what I am, I'm I'm very respectful of uh, a man whose roles and responsibilities involve treaty negotiations and and things that are far more complex and important than than maybe you know me with a hammer and a rock. And but I, I am very hopeful that I can pursue that as part of this community input process. Um, and maybe it will be from, from more, more people in the song. He's band members and not just the chief, I don't know, as well as the school children. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled because I know a lot of them, as, as um, the, the mayor mentioned, I've probably taught um, 2,000 elementary students how to carve a wolf in the last three years in the school system. And um, that, that, again, was um, great to be on that path and then working on a, a sculpture of my own, Tana, this wolf, with... Um, relationships with all these kids who have carved wolves and the school districts. Um, there's been input. Um, people have also contacted me. There's been input from somebody from Scotland, other people from different places saying, is it just Oak Bay? So I, I certainly am welcome everyone's input um, because there is a, a real international following after the, uh, the film came out. Um, so all these sources definitely inform the work, whether it's um, I carve elements of, of Takea's natural environment in the stone. Um, I, I haven't quite decided, but they are sort of the last details that I'm trying to work on in the next month. Thank you. I just cognizant of time, we have a, a fairly large agenda ahead of us, yeah. so I don't want to get too, uh, too uh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna cut off any discussion, but I also wanna make sure we're moving things forward. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? Um, Ms. Morden, are there any phone calls that have come in and, uh, that wish to speak to this item? Uh, none at the moment, Your Worship, but I'm just double checking with staff. Okay, I'll g we'll, we'll come back to any discussion here. But if anybody wishes to call in, this is your chance to do so. Two five zero five nine eight three three one one. Otherwise, we'll just make a recommendation to council uh, out of this out of this discussion. So I'll just, if you can wait a second, I'm just going to wait and see if there's any any call in. Your Worship, there are no calls. Okay. Well, let me know. Wave at me if there are, if you don't mind, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to this table. So I'll um, move that it be recommended to Council that the proposed siting of the art piece Takaya at Cattle Point be approved, and further that it be recommended to Council that the Mayor be directed to make every effort to secure the donation of the art for the District of Oak Bay. I moved and seconded, so that's to say yes to the siting. Thank you. Uh, are there any, is there dis uh, discussion here at the table? We've had some comments, maybe, but some, most some people just have any comments to this or questions at this point. Any comments? Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, um, and and Council. I will I will ask Council's indulgence through through you. Um, I am not in favor of the motion. Um, I will be judicious in my language, but I think it's important to make this point. Um, 
I want to acknowledge that everybody involved with this project, both the, especially the artist, the donors, the members of the community, and, and the people that have expressed their, their appreciation and, and their experience with the wolf. Uh, I do not mean to diminish their experience in any way or devalue uh, how they are approaching these things. Um, the, the experience uh, with the wolf is significant to everybody. Uh, so I want to make that absolutely and completely clear. Um, I have reservations about the project because of the nearness uh, to it, to the acknowledged spiritual value of the wolf to the Songhees First Nation. I, I do clearly acknowledge that there's been efforts both made on both be on behalf of the artist, and I appreciate that, and I know on behalf of the mayor as well, to reach out to the Songhees First Nation. Um, I'm conscious of my responsibility as an elected official to further the goals of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which really involves actively working to, to reconcile with First Nations groups and First Nations in our area. I, I do not purport to speak for the Songhees or what their wishes are, uh, but it involves our role as decision makers and how we approach uh, those things which are under our jurisdiction which may influence uh, an overlap with First Nations worldview. So I, I have reservations about that. I guess I would just say that as the, the purpose of this process has been for the community to reflect on its collective experience with, uh, with the wolf, uh, I, I would also ask that members of the community also reflect on how let's be conscious of the particular significance of the wolf to First Nations um, and, and how we interpret that and how we choose to uh, approach that in our own uh, interpretation. So again, I don't mean to speak for the Songhees in any way, shape, or form, but I do I am deeply committed to taking those opportunities for active reconciliation, uh, and I'm concerned that this may uh, not have gotten there. I, I thank, thank you. you. I, I really appreciate because we're still a former, not uh, we're, we're not at the point of interaction at this point. Sorry, um, but appreciate your comments, Mr. Uh, Councillor Appleton, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, I. I also I certainly appreciate all of the work that has uh, gone into this effort, and um, certainly from an artistic standpoint. Um, it, it's a, it's an incredible piece. I don't doubt that. So I certainly value all of those things, and I won't go into some of the the truth and reconciliation responsibilities because Councillor Appleton has al already spoken to that. But as a member of council, I also value as much as as the artwork. I value the the amazing ma marine uh, meadow that we have there, and I feel a strong. Uh, sense of uh, the responsibility of the community to also place as much value on protection of that area. And I don't think that enough has been done. Um, I think we could do uh, a, a much better job in that. So for those reasons, I, I'm not supporting this, although I certainly recognize the efforts of, of all and the amazing job by the artist. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I think everybody else spoke in comments as well as their piece. I'll, I won't have to say add much. I think appreciate the thoughtful comments, uh, Councillor Appleton and Councillor Patterson. I think that uh, you're reflecting the legitimate concerns of, of many people in the community as how much is enough is enough. Uh, what is the right uh, degree of protection versus uh, restoration? Um, I'm I'm touch on this one by a couple of points. One, it's interesting if you go down to the boat ramp. Uh, nearby, there was still a beware of wolf sign uh, beside that boat launch for people who were leaving the, the dock that was there for years. There is a, um, there's a direct line of sight across uh, that, um, you know, from that spot to the, to the islands in a way that, you know, on, um, you know, you can watch the sunrise through that gap at that, at that particular location. Um, uh, and it's just, there is a, and the, and the specific qualities of this particular stone and the, and the other uh, glacial erratics that exist around Oak Bay and the, and the South Island that it seems to just tie it together. So I, 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 I don't want to dismiss the concerns because I think they're very, very legitimate. But I think that uh, on the balance of things, 
we have uh, we've been very blessed here with a lot of incredibly generous donations of art. This is by far the most significant piece uh, that is potentially offered, not yet <laughs> formally offered. I'll do my best if this passes to to get it to come here. Um, um, but I'm also very touched by the by the words of Mr. Laform and and his attachment to that place and and the connection that he's thought of in that art to that place and. It's not the, the guiding part. Obviously, we have to just adjudicate our lands appropriately, but I feel very strongly in this case that that's a, there's a lot of pluses to this um, that override the concerns that have been raised, to, enough for me at this point, and I, I, not to disrespect the, the comments that have been made. I think they're very legitimate. Um, are there any other comments here before we vote? Uh, seeing any, I'll call, I'll call the question then. All those in favor and opposed? Councillor Appleton and Patterson opposed. So that will go to, I guess, uh, actually, it's, yeah, this would be a come back to council, I guess, for formal piece at the next meeting, but uh, we're recommending to ourselves, so it's a pretty straightforward process. And I'll be reaching out to Mr. Laform to you and to the donors uh, in the, this, this week, I'm sure, to, to talk about the next steps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for your, for your time and feedback and consideration. It's been uh, an interesting process, and <laughs> the uh, OPE has been very helpful. Yeah, well, thank you very much for your uh, for your willingness to participate. I really appreciate the, uh, I'll say there's a final comment, um, being open to the public input on this, independent of whether it ever ends up in Oak Bay, we still don't know that. Um, but just your connect, your willingness to, to take public input and reflect that in your artwork is greatly appreciated, uh, very much in alignment with what we're trying to do with our public art in general. So thank you for your willingness. Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thanks. What happens now is you leave and everybody wipes down like crazy your station, so okay. it's nothing personal. <laughs> Uh, item number two, travel and expenses remuneration uh, reimbursement policy. I believe we have Mr. Payne here to answer questions. <laughs> Bringing his own chair. <laughs> Participant exiting. Steve. Is Mr. Heidley signing off as well? No, Your Worship. I believe he was staying on to possibly answer any questions related to Councillor Nay's notice of motion. Oh, at the end. Okay, thank you. I, um, okay, that's fine. Uh, number two, travel and expenses reimbursement policy. Um, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, here to present the uh, draft travel and expense reimbursement policy for uh, committee input and council consideration. Um, our expense uh, policy hasn't been um, reviewed since approximately 2006, so it's uh, due for, uh, for a review. Uh, furthermore, the district's auditors uh, recommended that the policy be an updated to ensure that there's uh, a proper reimbursement approval hierarchy uh, in place for all employees, including uh, council, including the CAO and the CFO as well. Uh, so the draft policy reflects those recommendations. Um, staff have surveyed CRD municipalities and put together a draft for council consideration. Uh, we consider uh, best practices. Um, and the policy is uh, intended to apply to both council and, and uh, uh, district employees, but not to the um, police department. Some of the changes highlighted uh, in the staff report inc inc include uh, council travel. So there's uh, essentially a blanket approval for council travel to UBCM, AVIC, um, uh, FCM, uh, annually subject to budget approval. And then an additional uh, $1,000 for other meetings, courses, travel uh, that an account individual counselor may uh, pursue. Anything above that would require a resolution um, according to the draft policy. Uh, the per diem uh, amount ha is proposed to increase from $55 to $70, which is uh, the average across the CRD municipalities right now. There's basically a range of $50 up to 87 uh, and the, uh, the district was the second lowest at the time, um, probably just uh, evidence of the long, the long time that it's taken to review the policy. Um, and uh, the mileage uh, terms have been harmonized with the CAO reasonable rate. Um, which is um, uh, efficient from a process standpoint simply because the 
uh, rate doesn't have to be updated in the policy as the CRA updates their reasonable rate. It just floats with, with that. That ensures that uh, folks aren't uh, uh, su subjected to a taxable benefit either in the case where the rate exceeds the CRE rate. Um, and, and lastly, there's a, a private accommodation incentive that's been introduced in the policy so that uh, should people choose to uh, travel and stay with friends or family, uh, they can collect a bit of a, uh, an incentive, is what we're calling it, $50 per day, uh, which is uh, less than the typical accommodation expense that the district would be subject to. So it ends up being a bit of a win-win. A, a There's also some, some terms in the policy uh, outlining specific exclusions, um, just drawn from past experience of confusion from, from employees or, or inappropriate expenditures. So now they're specifically identified as exclusions in this policy for clarity. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Are there questions of Mr. Payne on this? Uh, Councillor Zelka, Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, just a few uh, simple, simple questions. Um, the, uh, the police budget is um, one of the few areas that we have uh, limited um, input on. Uh, uh, dare I say the word control is in the area of budgeting. Um, uh, yet they're exempted from this policy. Um, uh, how are expenses and travel reimbursements um, uh, controlled on the police side, please? Um, Mr. Payne, do you want me to answer that question, or would you like to? I, I'll leave that up to the chair. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it to you then, Mr. Payne. Go oh, ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the the uh, as 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 is the case with many um, municipal policies and financial policies, the the police department are invited to participate in that pol in those policies or enact them themselves. Uh, but essentially, the role of of council is to provide a, a, a expenditure. Uh, approval, so overall budget approval and funding of the department, but the operations themselves are left to the police board to govern. Um, so in this case, the the uh, uh, police chief did have input on on the uh, policy, and uh, but it's up to the police board's discretion whether or not to to enact such uh, policies um, for their uh, employees. Uh, final follow up: um, uh, Does that mean uh, uh, through the chair, maybe to the chair? Uh, do we then defer to um, the uh, chair of the police board and uh, the staff there for uh, final disposition of a policy like that? Just, I'm just curious. It would be up to the board as they do policy review to look at it, and they could adopt the municipal or not as they saw fit. Um, it's not out of alignment with the practice of the police board. There's a uh, one local BC Association of Police Board Governance Conference per year that usually a, a number of the members attend, anywhere from one to four probably in any given year, and then uh, same similar national sort of conference similar to FCM that they would attend. And other than that, there's really no additional expenses to speak of that, that are, are accomplished by the board. But those do form the board costs are included in the budget supplied by the uh, police board, and those that's where the point of review for the for council on that particular point, the policy itself would be to the board. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and um, through you to Mr. Payne. I'm just wondering if you could provide rationalization for some of the people from home that may be watching and have put this question forward. Um, uh, the rationale for no longer requiring to support the per diems with receipts or reconcile with actual costs. Uh, Mr. Payne? Uh, yes, thank you, through, uh, uh, through the chair. Uh, often uh, receipts are required for uh, a number of reasons, uh, sometimes just to ensure that, in fact, the expense did, did occur, and, and also as a cost control measure, because uh, um, sometimes the per diems were um, a maximum amount that could be reimbursed, and should someone um, spend less than that, it would be limited to what the actual expense was. What we found in, uh, in practice is that the staff time uh, required to reconcile such expenses often exceeds the benefit of that differential, that save. So you might save uh, $5 from review and actual receipts uh, because it didn't meet the, the per diem maximum, uh, but you've spent $30 worth of, tech, uh, of staff time and benefits to reconcile and execute that. Um, so fr from a matter of, of, of practical uh, experience, that's, that's one reason why, why we've done it. And also w we found that, uh, um, uh, you know, we, I reached out to a number of my colleagues and, and from my own experience, um, 
wanted to gauge whether or not the per diems that are uh, uh, suggested in the draft policy reflect reality. Uh, and and uh, in my judgment, they do. Go ahead. And just one other thing that I will I will raise as because it's not quite covered in here, but I'll I'll toss it out to Mr. Payne for perhaps future considerations. Um, when I travel to uh, some of the business meetings downtown, I use public transportation, and so um, although we talk about transportation costs and, and, and mileage, we don't really talk about bus fares and. Actually, for the same reason as uh, Mr. Payne has reflected that we don't, uh, we won't require receipts for per diems. I don't usually submit costs for the bus fare either. But nevertheless, it, it's something minor, but something to consider, perhaps for future expenses. Well, Mr. Payne, I might just expand that into a question because it ties to a question I have, and that is the. Um, this this talks it's, it seems primarily focused on travel. So when you're traveling, you get per diems and hotels, um, but built in there is meetings. And uh, is this intended to capture the the same policy for things like tr travel locally for meetings? Uh, you know, if, if you're meeting with a constituent and, and buying a coffee, is that kind of covered? Where is that sort of fineness uh, covered? We used to have a uh, a tax free stipend that we would just get, and that sort of covered all those kind of. Uh, incidental questions, but that isn't in place anymore. I'm not sure we have a very clear policy right now on what is or is not allowed to be uh, reimbursed. Yes, thank you. And an excellent question. I was going to mention that before as well, that the the, uh, the tax free portion of council remuneration previously was there to cover incidentals such as that. So since that changes, uh, council remuneration was also reflected, uh, was changed to reflect that that uh, that change. And, and thus, um, such expenses may be uh, eligible under a, a policy um, uh, such as this. So if there were um, uh, uh, travel within the CRD, if uh, councillors main, uh, maintain their mileage records, they could be reimbursed, reimbursed much like other employees who, who do travel throughout the CRD using their personal vehicle and are, and are reimbursed for mileage. Um, the, other, the other alternative is there's a, a tax form that can be filled out by by uh, a member of council at the end of the year saying I was required to incur these expenses and therefore they're, they're tax deductible. But they end up being um, kind of insignificant and so they're usually not, it's usually not done. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Payne. Any other questions? Seeing none, there's a recommendation here. Is there anybody wish to make it or some other motion? Go ahead, Councilor Patterson. I will uh, move the recommendation uh, to Council that Council repeal the staff travel guidelines, conferences, and seminars, and courses policy 2006 and adopt travel and expenses reimbursement policy. Second. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, I will go to the f um, Ms. Morden. Are there any phone calls on this item from the public? No phone calls, Your Worship. I'm just double checking again with the front reception. If anybody is watching this live, all of the items on the agenda are open to public input. Uh, my suggestion is when we go, to, I'll, I will try and remind people at the beginning of each item that you can call in and you will take your calls on these items. But having no calls on this, I'm not terribly surprised by that. Um, I will call the question then, uh, unless there's any other discussion. Not seeing any, all those in favor. Opposed, then opposed. Thank you very much. That carries. And uh, you stick around for one more departmental budget transfer policy, Mr. Payne. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is a, a unique uh, policy uh, in draft form. And the reason I, I say that is because, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen a, a formal policy that accomplishes this actually articulated uh, in the form of a policy in my experience. And I, again, I surveyed the CRD. Uh, there's no particular formal policy that articulates what is being articulated here. Um, but what it, does, what it does accomplish is incorporates many of the principles that are in practice, in best practice, in, in budget uh, throughout the industry. Uh, and I know that because that's, that's how I've been trained. Um, the reason I thought it added value, you know, you know I always pause when I look around and, and I don't see a, another example of such a policy and thinking, you know, am, am I just that that uh, uh, weird guy that's that's <laughs> suggesting something that uh, someone else didn't have the 
bright idea, because I'm better at copying good ideas than coming up with all good ideas myself. Um, but the reason that I thought this really added value to the district was that it bridges council's vision that's articulated in our long-term financial plan document and the expenditure limits and, and legal spending limits that are in our financial plan bylaw, which are two separate things. And the bylaw itself really uh, only sets the maximum that staff can spend per year. It doesn't really say how we can spend that and, and what those funds should be used for. Uh, so again, that I believe that it bridges council's vi vision uh, for service delivery. So the intention of this policy is twofold, is to ensure that uh, staff use budgeted amounts to deliver council vision service levels and priorities and projects. And it also uh, ensures that operations aren't interrupted with immaterial budget variances. Because often you have a, a, a department um, nervous about uh, conducting spending because of small budget variances which can interrupt service delivery. So it's important to note the community charter uh, enables municipalities to prepare flexible financial plan bylaws. So for instance, our financial plan bylaw um, allocates 28 million in spending for general services, right? General services, so whatever that means. Uh, the reason that it is so flexible is so that um, when, uh, when the district needs to be able to shift to changing conditions, we can do that without legally violating our uh, expenditure limits. Regional districts don't have the same luxury. They have um, uh, very defined service areas, and if that service that service area can't go over by a fraction of a percentage because it's funded by very specific uh, uh, people that that reside there, so we we have that flexibility. But this framework provides um, a bit more structure to staff to deliver what council is asking to be delivered. So I think the policy strengthens accountability for staff and vision, uh, but it also increases their efficiency and ability to do, do so. Uh, there, um, uh, one important thing to, to note about this policy is that staff cannot increase or decrease service levels without council uh, approval. So that is articulated in, in the budget. So I have a couple examples, for instance. Suppose, suppose we uh, council allocates a certain uh, budget for solid waste management and right now we pick up uh, solid waste on a regular schedule uh, there's nothing legally to stop the director from enge uh, engineering from cutting that service in half and only showing up to pick up the, the, the garbage half as much as before the only thing really to stop them would be the the, the, the clear uh, community reaction to that that would show up on council's uh, uh, council's uh, foot, foot uh, uh, door stops. Um, this policy says exactly that, that the director of engineering or any other uh, staff member can't uh, choose to, to reduce the service level or increase that service level without uh, asking for council uh, approval to, to do that. So the budget variances that we are talking about here it, it are not the ones that would result in a service level decrease. So for instance, if, if solid waste this year uh, was expected to go over budget by 5%, but there was 5% savings in, in another division, and those service levels weren't impacted, the department manager would be uh, empowered to do that without coming to council and uh, requesting that budget transfer. Another example would be from the capital budget. We have a very long, a large list of equipment replacement this year, over $2 million in uh, public works equipment to be replaced. Uh, some of those uh, equipment replacements are over budget slightly, some are under budget slightly. Uh, we wouldn't want to have to ask the, uh, the, the superintendent of public works to prepare a report to come to council to ask for an extra $500 to purchase a piece of equipment that was already approved in the financial plan, e even though he has savings from the purchase of another piece of equipment. So those variances, um, the, the department manager is uh, empowered to manage those within the uh, the budget envelope that council approves and within this, the service levels that uh, council has envisioned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. And if anybody's watching at home, this is a good chance to call in. If you have any questions, 250-598-3311. We'll go first to questions uh, from council, or sorry, from the committee. Uh, um, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for this report, Mr. Mr. Payne. Um, uh, there are components, of course, that I agree with in it, and, and some that I, I, um, 
I will use terms that I actually gain from pretty much, well, all of the CAs I know, and that is to always have a healthy skepticism. <laughs> I can see Mr. Payne smiling, so he is probably a term that he's f quite familiar with. But to have a healthy skepticism of how, uh, how budgeting um, is done and how financial reporting is presented. So um, there were a number of concerns that uh, I did bring forward before, but I'd like to focus um, primarily on a, on a couple of them. Um, the first one is life cycle costs, because in the uh, report it's, it does instruct that managers are not permitted to obligate the district to more than 25000 in new ongoing operating expenditures without council approval. Um, from my perspective, the $25,000 in new ongoing operating expenditures because of um, uh, project undertaken, work undertaken, is is fairly significant um, in in Oak Bay's budget, um, and and so I'm not I'm not totally clear on how you would get to that amount using <coughs> surplus funds from anything else, but for the for our five year budget, if we are if we are looking at the five-year budget as a whole, and that is why we are trying to be more flexible in creating um, opportunities to move forward with particularly capital projects, things like that. But the life cycle costs are determined uh, based on the information you, Mr. Payne has provided to me. The life cycle costs are, are only um, rolled into the budget at the time that council approves that capital as opposed to embedded in the total five-year financial plan bylaw. Is that correct? Mr. Payne? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> the, I'm thinking back to uh, 2020, uh, which we're in right now. <laughs> um, now, typically, what I uh, what uh, I, I will do is when a, a capital request comes forward that is uh, that clearly results in um, additional life cycle costs, more operating costs that haven't previously been incorporated into the budget, I need to bring that forward to council to consider, um, as you mentioned, the full cost of it, not just the capital uh, component. So not just the the construction or purchase, but what are we going to have to pay to maintain this afterwards? Um, now. Uh, I will integrate. I will integrate the uh, ongoing operating costs of that, assuming that council will approve it, if it fits within the five-year financial plan. So what I mean, I'll use Carnarvon Park again as an example. Um, Carnarvon Park is a five million dollar capital expenditure that was put into the budget for 2024. The operating cost of that wouldn't wouldn't um, kick in until 2025, which was outside of the scope of the financial plan. Had it been within the scope of the financial plan, I would have integrated it in there, um, but it would not have shown up in the final financial plan bylaw without council endorsing ex exactly that. Thank Council you. Patterson? Yeah, you, can I also just, you, you touched on the question of how did the $25,000 number get selected. Perhaps Mr. Payne would, would like him to answer that question as well, or are you satisfied? Uh, just, yeah, the magnitude of that, how we, how we arrived at, the twenty-five thousand dollar figure, because if you had one or two items that that came on stream that added up, that's all future costs that then keep building. And um, so, I just want to be very clear that that we're all on site on council with understanding that these costs could rack up, and those are future costs that um, would then increase uh, perhaps to a higher level the total amount of the the plan on a go-forward basis. Sure. Mr. Payne? Uh, thank you, uh, through Your Worship. Uh, a, a good question. $25,000, it's a bit arbitrary, but $25,000 was um, basically one-tenth of 1% 1 tax increase. So let's assume we have 10, 10 departments. You're right. Every Everyone could obligate the, the district to $25,000, which would be uh, basically a 1% tax increase and, and um, going forward. So uh, th there's uh, that, that was how I came up with that figure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Yeah. 
for Hurricane Council Patrick. Some things that we have to uh, consider. Um, the one other item that I want to talk about because it, it, the report is is silent on it, um, and that is the contingency funds that are allowed, particularly in capital projects, more so than um, our operating budget. But you know, if I look at the capital. Well, say for 2020, um, we have about 12 million in capital. Sometimes contingencies will range from five to 10 percent, and and even more. But even at five percent, um, contingencies on capitals could add up to, you know, six hundred thousand dollars. So, um, when we're creating flexibility to staff, I'm not certain that I want to as a member of council, <laughs> be creating that much flexibility. And so um, how, how, would, how would we identify, most of the reports on the capital projects don't identify for council the separate amount that is the contingency amount of the project. Um, and then how, how will we be informed what the contingency is or what the contingency was and what the intent is on either rolling that forward for future capital projects or allowing it to be spent at staff's discretion within the budget year um, without having that transparency available and accountability for council to the to the public. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. Mr. Payne. Uh, th thank you, Your Worship. So the, the contingency, uh, let's call it built into capital projects is an, is an ex excellent example, uh, really depends on the degree of um, uh, to which a, a budget can is certain, right? So sometimes we, we bring forward a, a, a budget for a capital project that it's already been out to tender, so we know exactly what the cost is going to be. No contingency needed, except for maybe a bit. A, a bit. Um, other projects haven't been out to competition. There isn't an active market. Difficult to determine where it's going to show up. Uh, larger, larger contingency. Uh, staff, staff could disclose that if that's council's wish, um, project by project or at any point uh, uh, built into the specific projects. There's also other contingencies built into uh, the the budget itself that are that are discussed with council at the time. You, I'll use for example. Um, we have, uh, we have $200,000 annually tax-funded contingency built into the overall operating budget. So that's disclosed to council at the, uh, at, at the financial uh, planning uh, process. Uh, we're not predicting that that's being used this year. Last year, we, we increased the contingency by over $600,000 for COVID. It's not likely that that's going to get used this year. There's also a contingency in the budget for major crimes, for the use of major crimes reserves in case. Um, and the use of those contingency funds uh, are, are, are independent based on those contingency funds. Uh, major crimes, for instance, it, it would, wouldn't be a, a appropriate to ask council for um, approval to use that in, in the middle of an active case. Um, but other contingency funds, it might be appropriate to come to council first before expending those. So it's really, the answer depends on uh, what contingency funds are being spent on. Uh, but I think in particular, council, pa Councillor Patterson is asking about capital project contingencies, and those can be disclosed as, as needed or as requested. Councillor Patterson. So for clarification then, is the intent of this policy to, um, if that amount was, 100,000, 200,000 or more to allow staff the discretion to use that money for other other items without coming back to council first. I see. Yes, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't answer the second uh, part of your question, was, which is let's say we have a $400,000 capital item and $50,000 of that is contingency. The capital project concludes with $400,000. Now what happens to that $50,000 that was in there? Uh, and the answer to that would be, uh, assuming it doesn't get spelt, uh, spent uh, otherwise, it's just funds that don't come out of the reserve to fund the project, so it remains within the reserve that funded that project. But this but this uh, policy would, would allow um, uh, uh, directors to reallocate that for within their 
their capital pool. So if for, if for instance we had a million dollar capital budget for Parks, Rec and Culture uh, and though, uh, and uh, they they were over budget another project. They could use unspent contingency funds from another project. This policy would allow that. Elsie yeah. Patterson. Thank you. I'm that uh, you know. I, I have to think about how I feel about that. I'm not. I'm not sure that that is is uh, something that I you know. Uh, I think I would have to give more thought to it. But when we talk about providing service guidelines um, or, or providing service that um, is what council has determined, the difficulty I have with this is that, um, again, coming back mainly to infrastructure and large capital projects, um, the our program on asset uh, management and the strategy for it is not sufficiently documented at this time uh, to comment in any great way, I think, here from Council. But uh, I think I would have difficulty saying that the condition of the infrastructure is at a level of service that is one that I support. In fact, uh, I think that the level of service is something that I want to improve greatly on the the infrastructure. So um, how will, how does staff gauge then what the money, what the, what extra surplus monies could be spent on when they, it, it could then fall to them to interpret where the, where that money is best allocated rather than council having also a voice in where that money is allocated. Mr. Payne? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And, and it's an excellent question. And what I would say is that contingency money that is built into a project plan, for instance, is um, it's, it's not expected to be surplus money. It's on the balance of probabilities will get used, right? So if, if you have a Class D estimate on a, on a project, it's usually plus or minus 50% is, is what the, um, w where the, the final cost will show up. And that's a, large, that's, a, that's a large range. And if you add up all the projects that were class D, they're going to fall plus or minus 50%. So the contingency that's built into the project is expected to have to support that project. Um, uh, sometimes that doesn't happen, and there's surplus funds. Um, but I, but I, I think I understand a, a, um, the valid point that's be, that's being made is that uh, if levels are, of service aren't established for um, infrastructure replacement, then and then there is a surplus from a capital project. Uh, council should have the opportunity to direct those surplus funds to the levels of service elsewhere that they want to see improved. So. Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> Councillor Patterson. Thank you. At least we're, we're getting to a meeting of the minds, so that, that, that's good. Uh, but the policy isn't clear on those issues, and I guess that's my healthy skepticism on how, if there's suggestions for amending this policy to take those things into consideration, or to in other ways respond so that council, who is accountable to the community for the finances of the district, um, has, a, has a clear understanding in any given year of how this will roll out and that there's no large surprises that where we, after the fact, have dissatisfaction with how the money is is applied. Uh, thank you, Councillor Patterson. It is committee of the whole, so we can make we can make suggestions and 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 uh, when the when the policy comes back. Well, it's I think the conversation is happening here. I know Mr. Payne's listening, and if there's things that he agrees with that should be added or could be added to make that more clear, um, we we, we can take motions from the table to to add things, but. 
Um, part of this is a bit informal in terms of some of those pieces. So if there's, th I think our job is to try and flag things that we see as untenable and we can try and address those more directly. Um, Mr. Payne, did you have something else to add to that? Uh, uh, a nice you see the, the, the note being passed over, so. Well, it, it's never good to get a pink slip from your boss, <laughs> but I have one here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a valid point that um, uh, you know we're we're at the infancy of developing our capital program, and I, I think it's a valid point, which I uh, well, I would actually like to take into consideration that when council has approved funds for a specific project, it is different than funds for a program. So if, for instance, we have a capital program that's informed by master plans, we've outlined this the sewer uh, rehab which involves a number of projects to make up the program, having a variance within a program is much different than, well, please go replace a transformer. Now we have surplus funds from a transformer, apply it to a pool, which is unrelated. So, so, I, so uh, using surplus funds from unrelated capital projects to, uh, is awkward. Um, using funds from within a program does make sense. It's much like it's much like your operating budget. You're using f funds within your operating budget to fund operations. So, uh, so, so excellent input. Okay. Uh, I'll <laughs> Are there any other questions of Mr. Ping, Mr. S uh, Councilor Zelka, and the Councilor Appleton? Uh, thank you. Just uh, uh, um, general murmurs of uh, of. Uh, of uh, sounds in favor of this. Uh, I, I, I very much appreciate what, uh, what you're getting at. It seems that there's a, there's a desire for financial flexibility um, uh, in general. Uh, and, you know, being a small uh, district, I, I think financial flexibility to some extent is very helpful. Um, uh, so the question is, since we're dealing with Class D and Class C estimates uh, for many of the things that we have to go forward on, um, and that sometimes they come in plus and sometimes they come in negative, um, while meeting these service levels that we set here at this table, is it possible that with this policy, um, some of these projects could be achieved faster? Mr. Payne? Uh, th thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I do believe so. I, I believe what, what happens with the adherence or with the adoption of this policy is uh, – the director of Parks, Rec, and Culture, for instance, no longer needs to write a, a report to council to ask for, uh, to use budget surplus funds from X to pay for, for Y. So it, it does increase um, um, the efficiency there uh, and the productivity there. So to some, some degree, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I would tend to agree with you. Um, I appreciate the Section 5 aspect uh, in terms of um, uh, the reporting out at quarter two and quarter three. Um, uh, and I presume, since this is a policy, if uh, at that reporting out time we, uh, as a body, disagree with any of the decisions that were made, we could potentially at that time change the policy. Uh, that's more of a rhetorical question. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zelka. Yes, I mean, the policies are always ours to change if we see fit. Uh, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you to staff. I'm just wondering whether I can get a little bit of clarification on it. On Section 3.8, uh, it indicates that uh, managers may transfer their capital budgets to purchase, acquire, refurbish, or improve capital assets not specifically identified in departmental capital budget. Um, and I'm just wondering what would actually fall in that category because my, my I guess my expectation would be that the, the, the capital needs would be identified in the departmental budgets in the financial plan at the beginning of the year. Uh, so what would constitute uh, a, a, a novel capital asset that wasn't already identified in the capital budget and by its extension, the overall budget? Mr. Payne? Uh, yes, thank you, through Your Worship. Um, well, an example from this year, which you'll see in the quarter three budget report, was uh, emergency furnace repairs that needed to be done um, at uh, Henderson uh, Rec Center, for instance, and there was no uh, specific capital item identified in, in the plan for that, um, but surplus from the Oak Bay Rec Center uh, roof replacement was used to fund that. Uh, so some of, so this stuff is is already in practice. The 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 policy formalizes it, um, uh, but yeah. So so that's an example. Now, if if we went if we transitioned our our 
capital budget to more of the program base, as I mentioned, we would have instead of a specific project like the uh, Monterey uh, furnaces, we would have general capital building maintenance. That would be the program. And then the service levels would be established. You know, I'm sure it would say something like, well, maintain the buildings in, 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 op in operating uh, order to provide the service that it was built for. Uh, and then that would provide the flexibility within the program to uh, s spend those funds as opposed to uh, 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 using surplus funds from a specific unrelated project. Just a quick follow-up, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, so we're, we're talking then pot potentially, or in this particular case, we're talking about unanticipated costs that could be funded through the existing budget or through a budget transfer rather than having to dip into a reserve. Do I get that right? Through Your Worship, yes, or, or come back to Council and, and ask. So then we're not talking about a situation, the way I read this, and I'm probably getting it wrong, but the way I, I read this is that if the budget includes budget for you know two lawnmowers or something of that nature, and it just so happens that we get a really great deal on those and we can purchase three lawnmowers instead of two, um, we wouldn't go forward and do that, even if it fit under the existing budget, because it would commit us to potentially long-term maintenance costs because we're maintaining three capital assets instead of two. Do I get that right? Through your worship. Thank you. I, I, it, I think everyone's getting it because that's a great example uh, because it would uh, commit us to long-term operating costs and would it increase our service level expectation as well. So if we only need two lawnmowers to, uh, to uh, deliver the lawn mowing that council sees and <laughs> envision the community, you know, we don't need to invest in other capital and we wouldn't be permitted to do that under this policy. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Are there any other questions of uh, Mr. Payne? I'll, I have just a couple very quick uh, pieces here. First of all, I, I, my comment is, you know, I think it reflects the, the best the practices that are undertaken here in the community as a as a district overall, and you know, I think we want to make sure that it's supporting that that culture of shared responsibility across departments and through departments, and not try to allow silos to be built. And I, uh, my read of this was sort of from that lens, and does it accomplish that? And I think it does. And uh, I don't know, Mr. Payne, if you can comment on that if you wish, but that was my observation. And I guess my questions uh, on this was just the one, the interdepartmental budget transfers approved by the CAO. And uh, this goes way back, but I remember there was a situation once where um, a, sub a contractor who was, who was meant to be installing something for Parks and Rec was unable to fulfill, uh, and uh, Public Works was able to sort of fill in their, their little odds and ends of time when, say, a gravel truck didn't show up and they had a few an hour to spare or two, they would go and help and finish that project. And those kind of little transfers that happen often have to happen quickly. Um, and so in emergency situations, is the wording where the CAO has to do it? Is that CAO or designate or... What is the the allowance for that that allows for those sorts of situations to be dealt with without holding up something that that might benefit from a timely response? Yes, thank you. Uh, and an inter interdepartment budget transfer um, would only be required when a department is expected overall to exceed its annual budget. So if it happened in June, plenty of time to find find room in the in the budget to to make those adjustments. But it's it's really uh, I'll, an example from last year was the fire department was expected to go over budget by uh, $200,000 because of overtime and a, and a number of other issues. And we came to council to ask for that. Um, we, had a, we had funding elsewhere in the financial plan, but it wasn't fire department funding. So this, this policy would allow the CAO to say, well, we're underspending in protective services, A, so we can fund the, the expected overage, and B. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Patterson, did you have anything else you wanted to add in terms of directives here you think would, would improve this? And we can test it through the committee. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I, you know, I really, for this one, it's, it's a tough one for me. I understand the rationalization for it. It's very difficult to... Um, to envision how this is going to happen when we have uh, such a limited asset man management strategy program developed at this point in time, and that's where our I see our, our future big cost items coming and where 
the policy may or may not kick in. But I guess, in my mind too, it is that we have had a very short time period of seeing financial reports. We d we don't have the we don't have the Q3 report at this point in time to you know by which to see I, what the financial reporting is going to look like, what the variance reporting is going to look like. So this is almost coming uh, just a little bit before there's really uh, a correlation in, in the reporting to how this might work. So it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's, you know, I'm trying to think of how you can do it, but it, it's all then in the financial reporting out so that we still we have accountability and transparency to the to the community and still uh, finances finances that are well within the purview of council making decisions and these are going forward future costs so we have so such little amount to work with right now I'm almost thinking that in, in my mind, I would like to see that at least the Q3 reporting package, and at the same time, I understand that this is such an unusual <laughs> year <laughs> that it's not the best basis for this, but uh, perhaps Mr. Payne can comment on that. I'll let him comment, but just procedurally, it would not be out of, out of turn if council wishes to, to consider that as a, uh, as a body, then uh, you could make a motion if this was to go forward to bring it back to a you know to a committee of the whole um, sometime in the next 18 months uh, the policy back just for review and we could at that point look at it see how it's working um, and provide any feedback on in in real terms if that was seen as a as a desirable piece it's, you're you're not incorrect there is a, we're a little bit of a carp over the horse but we're also trying to clearly Mr. Payne is trying to uh, address these kind of policy holes as as he goes so uh, Mr. Payne you want to comment. Uh, Yes, Your Worship, and, and um, uh, uh, staff staff are appreciative of, of the comments and I input, and I think uh, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Patterson makes a good point. Uh, Council will have the opportunity to see these practices in practice a bit more with the quarterly reporting, and you'll see that I've, I've already applying these principles in the in the day to day, um, and and then Council can decide. If, uh, if that's what they want to see. But there's, there's clearly uh, different expectations from members of council um, in, in terms of what uh, uh, they, they um, or the, the, without a policy, there is the opportunity for differences in opinion when those quarterly reports come, so, w which is okay. We can, work, we can work through that. But again, as an example, I, I might come to council with a quarterly report. It'll, all be, it'll always be transparent and, and it'll show the projects where we're over budget and and so there's a negative variance and a counselor or a number of counselors might say I think that's something you should have consulted us with and then my answer is well there's no real clear guidance <laughs> we don't have a policy let's have a policy uh, but that doesn't mean we need to adopt a policy now as I mentioned uh, uh, there's no such policy like this in in our neighbors that I'm aware of um, so it, it can be a work a work in progress as the the chair uh, um, Suggested. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. Um, I, I actually feel comfortable with the policy, and but I, I like the idea of having a, a check-in in, you know, six months, a year, or whatever, um, just to make sure that everything is on track the way that we, we envision this to be on track. So so I'm actually quite comfortable with moving this, this recommendation forward um, now and then just coming back in six months, 12 months, whatever it might happen to be, just to have a review. Yeah, if I have a suggestion, I was just thinking about this, perhaps uh, along with the, if, the, if the, the policy could be brought back along with the Q3 report in 2021, that way we would actually see the Q3 report, we'd have a couple of iterations of reports that have come through, and we'd be, and we'd have the policy there to look at and say, oh, okay, this is what's being reported, this is what's happening, and we could, we could consider it again at that point. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, Mr. Payne, I'll just go to you in terms of timing. If it, this policy passes through council to have it come back at that time, is that a reasonable? Not not to bring anything changes at that point, just to bring back the policy so we could again review it that in the context of that Q3 reporting next year. Does that make sense? Your Worship, yes, it does make sense. And I think it would also give staff the opportunity to um, 
consider the concept of a capital program budget and how, how variances can be applied in, the, in that context as opposed to specific capital projects. Because the, the staff right now are working on, on master plans and that, that um, uh, populate capital programs. So it, it would be a good and timely time to do that. So was that a motion, Councilor Braithwaite? Yes. <laughs> so the, was that the move, the recommendation, and to report and to re and bring this back to our committee of the whole next year at, uh, at the same time as the Q3 reporting? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, your microphone is off. Oh, it does now. <laughs> I will second that. <laughs> oh, your microphone is on there. Okay, we're. We have a little poll to guys, but the microphones have come back on, so we'll just nobody breathe. Second. Yeah, uh, moved and seconded. Okay. Uh, is there any further discussion on that then? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And opposed. That, so that'll come to, uh, that we'll still come to council next week for, for formal of, for approval of the policy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, council. Thank you, Mr. Payne. It was, uh, thank you for, for, just stepping out and doing what you think is right <laughs> it makes it uh, interesting for conversation, but uh, I, it's nice to see us moving our, our organization forward in this way. Um, we have up next a development permit uh, for 2140 Cadbury Bay Road. I believe we have uh, Mr. Anderson either on the, f oh no. Um, oh, he is, okay. And I understand the applicant is on the phone, is that correct? That's correct. Are we ready? Okay, so uh, for anybody who does wish to call in, this is on uh, 2140 Beach or Cadbury Bay Road. Uh, this would be the opportune time to call in and we'll check in with you after. Uh, this is, uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Buffett, uh, planner, give a, uh, a quick overview of this application. Welcome, Mr. Buffett. Thank you, Your Worship. So this is a form and character development permit. Are we, Zelka? Our Councilor Zelka just stepped out for a moment here. We'll just, we can wait for him to come back. Oh. Um, I'm not sure how long he's gonna be. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Buffett. This is uh, Councilor Zalker is back in the room. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a form and character development permit to enable balcony guard replacements on an existing multifamily bil building located at 2140 Cadbury Bay Road. Um, it's directly across the street from Oak Bay High. The proposed changes include removing the existing wooden balcony guards and replacing it with a, a coffee-colored aluminum rail system with glass panels. The color scheme is generally sympathetic with the existing building. Um, the building actually consists of two components. The original building was constructed in 1956, and that's the portion of the building that's right up front, really closer to the street. Um, and then there was an addition that was built in 1985, and these two buildings are connected via a breezeway. Um, the guard replacements are actually limited to the rear portion of the building, so the impact of the streetscape is, is fairly uh, subdued. Um, the property is located in the multi-unit residential development permit area, and so that's why we're here with a development permit. Uh, they need one to proceed with those works. The official community plan includes guidelines for form and character alterations such as this, and, and that assessment has been included in the report submitted to council. Um, there's no expansion to the building itself, and there's no trees that would be impacted as part of this. 
and staff are recommending that the proposal to undertake those modifications to the existing building at 2140 Cadbro Bay Road be approved subject to the issuance of a development permit. Okay, thank you very much. I understand the applicant is available on the phone, but we won't go there unless we have questions uh, for the applicant. So uh, are there any questions of staff or the applicant? I'm not seeing any. Uh, oh, Councilor do, Patterson? I oh, before, you, before, you, before I get a motion, I'm just going to reach out. Uh, Ms. Morden, has there been any phone calls on this item uh, that from the public who wish to speak to it? No phone calls as of right now. I'll just double check. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, Councilor Patterson, go ahead. I will move that it be recommended to Council the pros proposals to undertake exterior alterations to the existing building at 2140 Cadbury Bay Road be approved subject to the issuance of development permit DP. Zero, zero, well, several zeros in a 32. <laughs> the second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? I'm not seeing any. All those in favor? Uh, any opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. That was uh, considerably faster than the last one. Uh, so that's uh, much appreciated. Uh, next up, we have items Upland Siting and Design for ADP 00124-3535 Upper Terrace Road. Thanks again, Your Worship. Well, before you start, I just, I'll also, if anybody is watching and you wish to speak to this, uh, please do call 250-598-3311. That's 250-598-3311. That's in the agenda. Mr. Buffett, back to you. Sorry. Thank you. So this is an application for upland siting and design um, to enable a renovation to an existing single-family home that was uh, built in 1942, located at 3535 Upper Terrace Road in the Uplands neighborhood. Um, the proposed modification to the home is limited mainly to the rear elevation for, for changes to the home itself, uh, limited to mainly the rear elevation with an approximately 50 square meter addition at the back. They'll also, they're also proposing to enclose a, an existing balcony that's also covered, um, so it's already contributing to floor area ratio and all that zoning stuff. <laughs> um, these changes are consistent with the design of the home. They utilize uh, wood shingle cladding and all the new windows and doors are, are going to have a trim that matches the existing. So the, the change is really sympathetic to the existing building and, and the existing design. An accessory building is also proposed at the rear of the property and it meets all the zone requirements as well, including lot coverage, floor area ratio and setbacks. The design of the accessory building does respond to the context of the main home and it, it utilizes the same materials and that's consistent with um, the Uplands design guidelines and OCP policies. Both the proposed addition and the accessory building are cited so as to minimize the impact to trees. Uh, no trees are, are going to be removed or impacted adversely by this application or by this proposal. Um, we've also included an assessment of the project and how it's performing relative to the Uplands um, OCP policy relative to the Uplands and the Uplands design, gui design guidelines, and that's also been included in Council's uh, agenda package. Um, generally, staff are of the opinion that the proposal is consistent with those guidelines, and the project does support the, the Uplands park-like setting. Um, significant plantings are already present on the site and some additional lower plantings are proposed as well as one new canopy tree but the canopy is already quite healthy on this site um yeah uh, at this point staff would be recommending uh, that the proposal be approved as to upland siting and design thank you thank you mr buffett are there any questions uh is the applicant on the phone for this as well miss morden Yes, okay. We'll, well, we don't need to talk to the uh, applicant unless there's questions specifically for the applicant. I don't see a lot of hands shooting up. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the public? Uh, Ms. Borden, has there been any phone calls on this item? No phone calls on this item, Your Worship. Okay, thank you very much. Um, back to this table. Go ahead, Councillor Green. I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Moved and seconded. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion on this item? I'm not seeing any. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. Um, we have last up a development variance permit for 629 Beach Drive. Uh, again, if anybody is watching at home and wishes to comment on this variance permit, you may do so. 250-598-3311. Uh, uh, as all variance permits do, there is a process, if it passes through this body, to go to uh, public notification for immediate neighbors, uh, and um, and that will come back to council for consideration. Uh, Mr. Buffett, go ahead. 
I know this, the cable going on. We have finicky microphones. <laughs> oh, there you go. His microphone is back on. Somebody did the right thing. Thank you very much. Some gremlins in our in our midst. Go ahead, Mr. Buffett. Thanks again, Your Worship. So this is an application for a development variance permit to allow a reduced setback between a proposed swimming pool and a home that's currently under construction at 629 Beach Drive in South Oak Bay. Um, the home is nearing completion. Uh, all necessary permits were pulled for that, that development or, or that house. The applicants would like to add an in-ground swimming pool and they've requested that the required separation between buildings and structures, which is three meters, be, be reduced to 1.59 meters to allow for a wider pool. All other setbacks are being met. All the exterior se setbacks would be, would be met. The setbacks to adjacent properties and to the street um, are all as per the zoning bylaw. Um, because of that, this, this proposal generally kind of minimizes the impact on those adjacent properties. And with that, I would sort of turn it back over to council. Staff are recommending that notification be given of council's consideration of that development variance permit. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Green? We have the microphones back again. I Excellent. Have, yeah. um, through you, Mayor, just I have a couple of qu uh, one major question, Mr. Buffett. Will will there be blasting involved in this project? And if so, do you know to what extent? Thank you. I've lost my mic. Oh. There we go. Back again, Mr. Buffett. There, there was blasting that was associated with the the building of the home, and they did pre-blast to make way for for the pool. Um, I think the, the plan was to build a pool either that met the requirements or that had this setback adjusted. So uh, there isn't anticipated to be additional blasting associated with this project. That's, that's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Braithwaite, did you want to speak? No. So those, are, those of you at home, our microphones seem to be turning off and on at, uh, at random intervals here, so we're just uh, struggling a little bit with our technology. Um, any other questions of Mr. Buffett or the applicant? Not seeing any, Ms. Borden. Are there any calls that have come in on this particular item? There are no calls, Your Worship. Okay, so back to this table then. Uh, comments or uh, probably a motion is in order, then we can speak to the motion. Councillor Green? I'm prepared to move the motion. Move the recommendation? Yes, the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. And uh, is there a seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. Mm -hmm. Oh, they sh <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll. Uh, we, it was moved and seconded, <laughs> and I will certainly wait for people to have a chance to discuss. But uh, don't see any hands, so I will call the question, which only requires question hands and no no talking. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to go move on. I th uh, we'll move on to the next item in just about uh, four or five minutes here. We're just going to do a quick tech test, test to make sure that we get our microphones all working in order before we come back. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you can have two on, but not Um, we don't have, uh, Ms. Varela, there was co contemplation, 
it'd be discussed that if we didn't do it as part of a motion to change the order of the uh, agenda um, to move the last item up in case Mr. Heidley wishes to not stay to the end. Um, are we are we amenable to just move item number eight? To, um, if Councillor Nay is amenable, just to move your motion, uh, the notice of motion up to the next item, just so we can have that dealt with. Mr. Heidley is on the phone waiting to talk to it, so. Uh, Oh, it is switched on the official yeah, agenda. Oh, there we go. Uh, oddly enough, my my paper notes didn't update automatically. How did that happen? Um, all right, so that's perfect. So next item on the agenda, then, <laughs> number seven, we have the notice of motion from Councillor Nay. And uh, yeah, Councillor Zalka? Uh, point of procedure, if I may. Uh, for a notice of motion, uh, do we debate it, or is it just simply being presented? No, this was a motion. She made, gave the notice of like, a number of months ago now, I think, that this was coming forward, and this is now in front of us as a, as a motion. Uh, so sorry, it's it's listed as a notice of motion, but in fact, it is a motion uh, that the councillor Day wishes to wish make at this time. Uh, and councillor Day, without uh, going through the whereases, if you would like to read the uh, the motion. Okay, that uh, staff be directed to provide a report on the district phasing out by 2024 the use of all gas-powered tools and small engine-driven equipment on municipal lands, including but not limited to gas-powered garden equipment such as leaf blowers, lawnmowers, and grass whippers to be replaced with renewably powered tools and equipment in consideration of availability, available technology budget and staff capacity within a multi-year program. And uh, that staff provide a report on the district issuing a moratorium that the use of leaf blowers not be used in Oak Bay unless they are indispensable. Uh, there's a motion made. Is there a seconder for this motion? Second. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ney, your motion. Do you wish to uh, give a little motivation? Right. So it's that time of the year, leaf blower time. Um, so um, it, it, it's a bit in response to that, but uh, uh, several other uh, considerations as, as well. So the way I'd like to speak to the motion is to speak to the two separate uh, aspects of the motion. So the first one has to do with uh, a phasing out from gas powered to um, um, uh, electric equipment more generally. Uh, but really the focus is, is it is uh, the leaf blower issue has been incorporated into this more general phase out because it simply seems to make sense. But um, with regards to the leaf blower, it's it's rather obvious. I think everybody's very much aware that uh, the the issue with the leaf blower has to do uh, with um, the noise that's that's more than a nuisance, also a health impact, and the emission of GHGs with the two-stroke engines in particular, as well as the um, dirty particulars that get suspended in in the air. So this this as part of the motion is uh, intended to work towards the phasing out of uh, the gas power to the electric powered uh, leaf blower as well as other tools and equipment. And I might just also note that um, you'll see in the whereas is that Victoria has um, targeted 2025 um, uh, to uh, phase out their gas powered equipment in their climate leadership plan. And uh, I've uh, uh, put in 2024 just as an effort to um, accelerate it and maybe so it, to align, but to accelerate uh, the the uh, the phase out as quickly as possible. And I will just also say that um, it, it as, as the council as the committee considers this part of the motion, uh, it, it's really clear that the technology from gas to electric is evolving all the time and that uh, it, it's, it's rather obvious that staff will always be making uh, decisions uh, around the weighing up of the cost, the budget they've got, and uh, the advancement in the technology um, that's being considered um, at, at that time. So, um, and I'm sure staff will have something to say about that. Um, 
the second part of the of the motion is perhaps uh, a bit more ambitious, but um, I, I do think it, it, it's timely, and uh, the use of a moratorium, I think, is a good policy tool. Um, before speaking to the specifics of it, I, I do want to say that what I mean by a moratorium, because there's different interpretations of what that, that means, but <clears throat> in this case, I'm speaking about uh, a sort of um, informal ban, if you will, uh, that would uh, be experienced as a suspension of the activity of using uh, leaf blowers in the municipality. And um, with regards to what would this achieve, um, while the phasing out of leaf blowers specifically um, from gas to electric would address to some greater degree, it would mitigate the noise and GHGs obviously, uh, but it wouldn't address the dirty particulates that get suspended in the air. And the other issue, less well known, but um, uh, uh, perhaps of most significance, is uh, the way that leaf blowers um, uh, have been understood now to, uh, when in use on, on grasses in urban areas, uh, sanitize um, the, the surface in such a way that they decimate the, the soil bioderm. And that's why last November, uh, Germany issued uh, uh, a countrywide, the Ministry of Environment issued a countrywide moratorium on the use of uh, leaf blowers except for non-essential use because it was understood that uh, the biodiversity um, in Germany had reduced 75 percent, um, um, uh, uh, there was a 75 percent reduction in flying bugs over three decades. And as a uh, one of many responses to the concern about the decimation of biodiversity in Germany, uh, they issued that moratorium. And uh, the issue around bio, um, biodiversity and the way that uh, it, uh, 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 it damages the soil is, is um, of concern to all of us, particularly in this time where we're experiencing a, um, a climate emergency where uh, we know we're in the Anthropocene, where we know we're moving towards the sixth extinction, et cetera. And, and I do want to say, in terms of this moratorium, um, about whether uh, the community is ready for this. I mean, if anybody's been watching even just Netflix lately, they'll have come across um, films that are um, having a lot of reach, uh, Kiss the Ground, which speaks to the importance of regenerating the soil, and then of course David Attenborough's A Life on the Planet, which really speaks in a very profound way to how steeply the planet's biodiversity has diminished over these last few decades. And and I I, I, I don't know if this is true for many of the council, but people I spoke speak to, and, and certainly myself, we're often looking for ways that we can um, contribute to, you know, making, um, address planetary health as well as public health. And sometimes, you know, people are getting very discouraged um, about how they can make a meaningful impact. I mean, just the example of, you know, should we recycle our plastics? And we've come to understand that that's a messy area now. And it seems to me that Leaf blowers may seem like a very siloed, very specific thing, but it has, so, it has a lot of implication around how we relate to our natural world and how we care for our natural world. And it's something that we can do. And we don't have mining. We don't have significant forestry. We don't have jurisdiction over fishing, et cetera. But we do have jurisdiction over um, our gardens. And um, actually, just yesterday, the Nature Conservancy of Canada issued a statement, and they say, consistent with what the German moratorium was all about, 
that urban lawn, lawns are becoming more important for nature and Canadians should reconsider raking up their leaves this fall. And so I've added this other component to, to this uh, larger motion that we really focus specifically on the use of um, the way that leaf blowers are being used in the municipality to encourage people to, 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 to encourage our community to really look at uh, uh, how they're caring for their, for their lawns. And um, as, we, as we consider a phase out of the, of the gas to the electorate, to also consider not just electric uh, leaf blowers, but to consider picking up a rake or even a broom when it comes to working on, on the pavement. And I'll say one more thing. Um, I recognize uh, that th there, is, there is a part of this motion that speaks to the corporation uh, phasing this out, and that's not um, a around uh, many gas-powered tools and engines. Uh, and I do recognize that the corporation's uh, needs and issues around the phase-out or even a, a moratorium on the leaf blowers, our need are, are, are very different than citizens. Uh, and and uh, so I, I just wanna say I don't discount that and I'll be interested to hear from staff about their, their, their perspective on that. Thank you, Councillor Nee. Uh, Councillor Appleton, you seconded. If you wanna add anything at this point, you can do to motivate. Otherwise, we'll go to questions and, and staff. No, thank you, Worship. Just very briefly, I just want to recognize Councillor Nay's leadership on this issue. She's well known as as and recognized as as taking a, a a lead on this topic, and I appreciate that very much. I've heard from many people in the community that that agree with the the crux of the motion, so definitely in in support of that. Um, and I would also take just make the very quick point that. In other jurisdictions, uh, further to Councillor Nay's point about whether or not this, what the what the relative impact of something like this is, it's been established in other jurisdictions that if government agencies and, and senior agencies demonstrate an, uh, a need or a, or, or create create the need for electric op alternatives to existing uh, gas powered. Uh, machines of all types, and that creates the uh, the innovation to drive the availability of those things. We often bemoan the the lack of electric police vehicles, these kinds of things, and and hope that we get those things. Uh, it's up to us at this level of government to create create the need by creating the 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 uh, jurisdictional environment to do that. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Um, I think it's probably. I'd like to have take uh, take questions. Uh, maybe worthwhile to ask some questions of staff as well, since this will have some impact on operational pieces. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also commend Councillor Nay for bringing this forward. I um, uh, I dislike intensely gas uh, powered leaf blowers, and um, and I do have four Gary Oaks, so I do a lot of raking. <laughs> I uh, I understand fully the implications. Um, of this. I'm just wondering, um, and I think there may be people reading this that will also wonder about point two, where we have indispensable in quotation marks, if Councillor Nay might perhaps uh, provide some opinion piece on what, what would be determined as indispensable. <laughs> Councillor Nay. Well, I, I, I'll be honest, it's, it's one that uh, puzzled me and it's obviously, it could become potentially problematic because of the ambiguity of who says what is indispensable. But I, but I think it, um, I, and I couldn't find anything on how the, the German community have, have done that, but th the way I read it, because it is a moratorium, not a ban, specifically, not a formal ban, that it's left to individuals uh, it, there's no enforcement to this. It, it's really an enabling kind of thing. And um, uh, it, it really gives the community an opportunity to uh, take this very seriously. And with, if it, if I, the way I see this, if, if, this is, if this is the direction council ended up moving, um, that 
people would, I, I think citizens would find that empowering and I, I, I have a sense they're ready to make the move. So the issue of somebody arguing, is this indispensable for this particular use or not? I think that's a non-issue. I, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm not saying it's not a good question, but I think the way it'll roll out is that it will become a non-issue in time. Thank you. Councillor Green? Yes, just very qu quickly, I also would like to commend um, Councillor Nay for bringing this forward. And she talks a lot about incremental change, and I think that's what we're looking for. I noticed that we had, we had hired an arborist recently. All of his tools, large and small, were electric power powered. We have an old leaf blower that is a plug-in, and we converted it to a hair dryer for the car, so we, we don't use it anymore as a leaf blower. <laughs> um, but I, I do think change is um, is catching in this case, and I, I think this is a good motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. I hope your car doesn't have too much hair. It would be disturbing. Uh, Councillor <laughs> uh, Councillor Braithwaite, did I see your hand? And then Councillor Zelka. Um, thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions on this because when I first read it, and it's, uh, I think it was the rendition prior to this one, um, I, the way I read it was, and tell me if I'm reading it incorrectly, that this is only for municipal use, not citizen use. Is that incorrect or correct? Uh, I, I'll go to Councillor Nature. I think there's two parts to this. Yeah, there are two parts to it, Councillor Braithwaite. So uh, the, the phasing out is because it includes a, a wide range of equipment and tools. It was the idea that was uh, to target the corporation so that if, if, if this were passed, then the corporation would serve as a model to citizens and one would anticipate a uh, spillover kind of impact to citizen uptake of uh, uh, electric powered tools and machinery. But, but the number two then is for citizens or is it for municipal also? Well, the, the, it's, it's for both. It's, it's not specific. So the intent was to be for citizens and the corporation. And so if I, if I might, so, and is that starting now or after the report? The idea was to wait for a report. Good. That, that answers quite a lot of the concerns that I've heard from, uh, from people. Um, then I do have um, two other questions, I think. Uh, number one, would the report that's coming back from staff include talking to citizens and landscaping com companies to get their input into their thoughts on this as well? Uh, Ms. Varela? Uh, Your Worship, I will defer to uh, Chris Hadley, who's also on the phone, but uh, depending on the extent of that, uh, that would uh, potentially have impact to work plan, a, a significant public engagement. Uh, so if it depends on the scale and scope of such an initiative, and if it was uh, significant, it might be something that needs to be referred to strategic planning, but again, we can have that discussion as we tease it apart. Um, oh, so thank you, and and then really, I, I'd probably go to Mr. Hydley with the with the next questions, which would be, um, it, as far as the municipality goes, um, we use do we use two stroke engines, as as Councillor Nay was talking about, or do we use four stroke engines? Mr. Hydley, uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, we use a great deal of two-stroke engines. Uh, some of our larger leaf blowers have four-stroke technology, which means they're a little bit more efficient in burning out the, the GHGs, but not nearly as efficient as a four-stroke engine. Okay, thank you. And do we have currently any electric at all? Mr. Hedley? We just purchased our first handheld electric leaf blower, which we would uh, use to clean up behind the leaf crew or clean up behind the cutting crew. Thank you. And, and if I might be indulged with another question. Um, so obviously, taking away uh, gas-powered um, items such as lawnmowers, leaf blowers, whippersnippers, um, that is going to add uh, quite a lot of 
manpower hours onto getting something done in the same way that we would with those um, uh, pieces of equipment. So I'm assuming that that part of the report that's going to come back will include how much it would um, how much it would increase um, uh, the number of hours that uh, would have to be worked to say clear, for example, um, the golf the golf course. Um, to, to mow it and to, to, to get rid of the leaves, whether they're using rakes or electric or something like that. Um, so that would be included in this report, because I think that's what I'd be really interested to see is how this affects our budget, the bottom line, our budget. You know, replacing that equipment and the number of man hours that, um, or person hours that, that uh, would be, in, uh, that, that would be increased. Uh, um, Mr. Hadley, go ahead. It would include that, but I will say this: we could make a pretty, uh, a relatively large step now with what technology uh, is available with electric equipment. Uh, where we may run into some uh, uh, staffing costs is at this time of year when we're clearing all of the taxed boulevards, in particularly in the uplands when the leaves are wet. Uh, the equipment isn't quite there yet, but when it comes to a chainsaw or a chainsaw on a, on a pole saw or uh, some of the weed eaters, et cetera, the technology is there now to us to, for us to make, be able to make the uh, transition. Thank you. That's really, really helpful, and um, I, that's good news as far as I'm concerned. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and, uh, and thank you to... Uh, 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 Councillor Rene for uh, continuing to bring this forward, and uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the climate change uh, committee uh, as well for uh, bringing forward their recommendations relating to this. Um, I do um, uh, uh, want to point out uh, that there's some good uh, policy um, uh, supporting this. Um, the University of Victoria is a civil engineering department. Uh, the chair of that department, Chris Kennedy, uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, points that he's uh, pressing with his students uh, is uh, as a way of uh, benefiting all of Victoria, all of uh, Canada, all of the world from a place of, um, of uh, uh, carbon re reduction and, and trying to address biodiversity loss is looking at the concept of what he refers to as urban metabolism. It's a very interesting way of sort of looking at uh, the way a city works. And uh, point number one he pushes is to electrify everything. Uh, um, amongst, uh, amongst one of the uh, most uh, uh, effective things that uh, each of us can do. Um, so uh, that certainly is in, uh, is in uh, support uh, of, the, uh, of the points brought forward by Councillor Ney. Um, so uh, a, a question uh, for, for staff uh, um, uh, for point one um, with respect to the, uh, where we are with batteries. Um, uh, is there any um, uh, a concern with a 2024, um, uh, or it would, do you think more time might be needed? Uh, first question there. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zelka. Should I put that to Mr. Hydley or uh, uh, Your Worship, Rally? I think those are the kinds of details that we'd see brought out uh, in the report. Uh, certainly, uh, technology, uh, capacity, and budget, as all discussed here, uh, will have to uh, tease out. Uh, Mr. Heidley and I have had uh, extensive conversation about uh, the technology that is available uh, and how much uh, council would like to invest in that kind of equipment right now versus waiting a couple years. Uh, Councillor Ney and I have also touched base on that. So I think those are the kinds of details that, that we'd like to see included in the report. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Thank you. Um, uh, I, so I, I'm very much uh, in favor of uh, of uh, uh, hearing uh, the the results of uh, of that report, for in terms of especially in terms of point one, because it sounds like the uh, the the district of Oak Bay can uh, can can be a leader in this area. With respect to point two, um, I would hope that the report that comes forward on that would also make reference to the noise bylaw. Um, not just necessarily uh, Oak Bay coming forward with respect to ideas on how to replace the tools, but also p possibly some control mechanisms uh, to uh, restrict or um, direct uh, what, what can be done with respect to noise. Um, I, 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 what I'd like in particular about uh, this, uh, this motion is that it, it, it addresses not only the uh, environmental aspects, but also the noise aspects. So I very much look forward to seeing what can be done in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Um, I have a couple of quick questions, just so I think we're all very clear about what's being asked for. Because 
the the term of the of use of gas powered uh, versus uh, purchase of gas powered are two very different things. One would be, you know, as we replace equipment, that no nothing new is purchased after twenty twenty four, and the notion that using it would mean that we would have to do a complete replacement of all equipment that we use, including all the tractors and everything else that mow our lawns. Uh, big expensive equipment. So just for my clarification, is the intention here, the wording that's provided, uh, Councillor Ney, the use of gas powered or that the, the consideration of purchasing, no more purchasing of equipment past 2024? Yeah, it, it, it does become problematic when we're talking about the corporation versus residents because the issue you've just brought up is more relevant to the corporation but less relevant uh, to the residents. So um, I, I think to answer your question specifically, that the purchase, that is, um, you know, it's talking about a phased in purchasing as technology and budget um, considerations are taken into account. So I, I, I would say the first one is with the corporation. Uh, the, the complication, I think what you're bringing up is that if, there, if, if the council did move towards a moratorium on, on the gas powered. No, it was, no, sorry, that's there, not there, the no, issue, it was, it? it was with the municipal, just yeah. the, because of the use, the term of like, if we stop using, because, it, you know, we mentioned there, the things like lawnmowers and, and yeah. grasshoppers, but there's, we have very large lawnmowers. They're, yeah. they're very expensive, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars sort of pieces. So is they, you know, I think I mean, it'll be a report back. I just thought yeah. it'd be, if there's, if you had clarification, well, if not, we'll get a report back I, on everything. I, I think it really is a phase thing. And, and I, I really would look for direction from, cause I, I have, I think staff, under they understand what this means for the municipality and for workers too like to not use gas powered stuff so i i, I would really look forward to uh, what the recommendation would be as they consider the criteria okay thank you I, that would just flag that as a concern if that for terms of a our, from budget impacts but i think the report would capture that the um the 2024 date or 2025 date, given the phased approach, I think it's, I, I appreciate being aspirational to be one better than Victoria on this one. So, you know, we'll see how that turns out. Um, I guess the last question I have is just the, the use of the word moratorium. I, to me, that's a word that we're, we're banning them. We're considered banning them. And I don't know that's, I mean, I, I, my little Google search of the German use was, the, I mean, I think everything gets translated from German and they probably have a 45 cylinder syllable long word to describe what they're describing. Um, but they, you know, the word I saw was discouraging. So they're discouraging use unless it's unless it's necessary, and that's a very different word than moratorium. Moratorium essentially says that we are going to prevent them from being used. So I guess that's the only consideration I would just have in that word is the intention here to, because if I was a staff person looking at that, they would look at it from a bylaw perspective of actually banning them, uh, as opposed to you know, are there ways of discouraging their use. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm clear in terms of what the intention is. Well, I I I, I take the point. Um, I I mean I I have pointed out this isn't uh, this uh, it, it is kind of um, it, this isn't about a formal ban. It doesn't have legislative teeth. We're not asking for a bylaw, but um, I I'm not I I can I can. I'm not sure about moratorium. I, I, what I do like about the word moratorium is it, it gives it some uh, informal authority, but it doesn't give it legal teeth. But so it's, it's trying to encourage, uh, and um, it's trying to discourage the use of, of them. And but it still gives discretion for users to use them if they deem it to be indispensable. So I, I don't know if it's the right word, Mr. Mayor, and if there's another word, but w one thing I would, it, it, I, I would like to see something that, that would really strongly encourage. I, and if moratorium is too strong, um, I'm not sure, but maybe there's a better word. I hate wordsmithing at these things. I think the important piece is that we're having a conversation and staff understand what the intent of this is so that when it comes back, we have that clarity. Um, but I will leave it, I, I will just put it to staff real quickly. If, if the word moratorium is left in there, can that word be left in and still capture the intent that uh, Councillor Ney is putting forward here? Mr. Heidley or Ms. Varela? Uh, Your Worship, one of the things that uh, I would like to explore more is, is there a, a, a desire, I guess, for some sort of public 
education program or engagement or so perhaps I could um, flesh that out with Councillor Nay a bit more uh, offline if Council chooses to go down this road. I just want to see if there's a, a potential impact work plan or budget if this is something new that's being added or if it's just something that um, council would see posted on the website or some social media tweets, that's very different than educational material. So I think I'd need to understand a bit more what the, the hope was around that. Okay, thank you, Councilor Green. Yes, just quickly, a moratorium actually means a temporary prohibition, so it's not a permanent prohibition, so I, just for clarification. Thank you. Um, so just so I'm for my clarity last in this as well is this would be one or two reports coming back to, to committee for consideration and really laying out the impacts of such a, a process on work plans and costs is that is that essentially what we're looking at here Ms. Varela? That's staff's understanding but uh, we'll we'll take direction accordingly your worship. Councillor Ney is that that's that captures us the attention okay thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, Councillor Appleton? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just um, and through you to staff, just picking up on something that Ms. Barella just mentioned. Um, I note that uh, that when we talk about public education on these types of these types of things more generally, uh, this was something that not maybe not this specific item, but this type of public education on these types of topics was incorporated into uh, the cool kit that was deferred on Council's work plan. Um, until 2021, um, as chair of the Climate Action Work Group, I'd, I'd certainly uh, encourage. Uh, I, I, I don't know how that discussion would would occur, but I would see that when the work, uh, the cool kit work that was deferred, is taken back up again, I think certainly that type of public education on that topic, and as amongst others, could be incorporated into that. So. Uh, I look forward to uh, being able to restart that work that was deferred. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. I don't see a lot of other hands up to comment or questions. Anything else? Um, we have a motion made by Councillor Ney and seconded. So if nothing else, I'll call the question. And all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. We are now going to item number nine, which was item number eight, and is really the big item on the agenda tonight, uh, but allows Mr. Hydley to go home, so uh, or to hang up at least. Uh, so thank, thank you, Mr. You so Hydley, for your for your contribution. Um, so we're going back to or to item number nine, existing establishing bylaws in terms of reference for our committees and commissions. And And so, Ms. Rella, welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, excited to be here uh, talking about how Council is investing in its Council uh, advisory bodies. Uh, with the Mayor's indulgence, I do want to um, send some kudos out to staff. I think all of the work to date on the commissions and committees has been a great example of uh, huge cross-departmental uh, cooperation. I'd also like to send a shout out to our former Director of Corporate Services, Deb Hopkins, who's uh, watching from home tonight. So hi, Deb. Um, so we'll just uh, get right into this. Uh, again, this is coming out of um, a few directions. So of course, Council's strategic plan talks about achieving service excellence, uh, striving to continually enhance and optimize our organization. And we want to enhance um, public engagement and corporate communication activities. Uh, building out of that strategic planning process, Council identified uh, 18 recommendations for a commission and committee review. Uh, and that was actually a year ago. Um, it's amazing the, 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 the idea of local government and uh, how you finally get to come out and unveil these huge, unwieldy pieces of work, such as uh, the links to the procedure bylaw that you've now seen in draft a couple times, the associated guidelines you're going to see shortly, uh, the policy that you adopted in July, these terms of reference tonight. There, there are a lot of pieces that staff has to keep moving all at the same time, and they've done this 
uh, amazing job of pulling it together in consideration of you had a small matter of a pandemic, you had some staffing changes. Uh, so again, kudos, kudos to staff across the organization. Um, we are looking at uh, advisory bodies, recognizing that they're an incredibly uh, important and formalized part of council's decision making. So the, the, the charter, the community charter actually recognizes uh, advisory bodies in the form of standing committees, select committees, and commissions, of which council has all of those. So this, is, this isn't the first time that you've seen this particular image, and it really talks about the importance of advisory bodies as a piece of council's decision making. So um, advisory bodies on, are on the left there. Other things that inform council's decision making, plans and policies, regulations and legislation, staff reports, and public input. And what's really interesting is that we have to get people understanding that this isn't about building consensus when we talk about council's decision making on this scale. This is really about uh, depth of information. Uh, council can take a staff report that that recommendation isn't the same as a recommendation from an advisory body and consider those differing opinions. You might also res refer a land use application to two advisory bodies that come out with different recommendations. Again, not about consensus. This is about giving you folks multiple lenses with which to make uh, the best governance decisions that you can. So we recognize advisory bodies as uh, vital and providing invaluable advice to support council's decision making. They feed into your strategic planning process and they provide an important community lens. When you look at the membership makeup of those advisory bodies, you're choosing people to those committees who have a particular lens. So again, part of that community representation. Um, so council adopted that commission and committee policy in July. Uh, that was a really big piece of work, but we had to get that done before we could do these terms of reference and establishing bylaws. It referred, it informed a lot of the mechanics. Um, so under the policy uh, you saw on July, we tried to clarify how advice and recommendations to council it are made. Uh, we acknowledge the key community lens I just referred to, uh, the link to strategic priorities, and we recognize advisory bodies also as an opportunity for civic involvement in Oak Bay and our community. So background, uh, back to that year ago, uh, staff, uh, based on council direction, undertook uh, a lot of those big pieces of work. We wanted to ensure that the role of advisory bodies uh, in relation to effective governance and decision making were well defined, clearly understood and implemented effectively. It was the one common theme that we heard over and over and over again is that we needed role clarification and we needed to get really clear on the mandates. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were making good use of, of the time of both the people who served on those advisory bodies as well as staff time and council. Um, review included meetings with all the commissions and committees and there was a survey done of uh, individual uh, voluntary, uh, volunteer members, excuse me. So again, the, the products that you're seeing delivered both in the policy, the terms of reference, the establishing bylaw, those were actually informed by uh, those interviews with staff, council and the individual members themselves. And then we've tried to keep um, ongoing communication to volunteers uh, regarding next steps because of course with that small matter of a, a pandemic to date, uh, we know this timeline has gotten stretched out. Uh, the last piece of correspondence that went out was in August uh, from the mayor. Uh, and certainly I know that the um, council liaisons have been in communication. I sat in on a, an art advisory committee meeting the other day. So again, uh, doing our best. Uh, I think everyone recognizes the delay in time and moving forward. Uh, I actually think at great speed when you look at what we've been faced with. So um, October, 18 recommendations. COVID hit in March. Uh, you had Christmas in there for December. Um, July, we had the commission and committee policy. September, you reviewed your draft procedure bylaw. 
and um, we are continuing to uh, deal with commissions and committees as business arises. So I wouldn't say we're back to a regular meeting schedule. We're doing an approach of as business arises. Um, and a full status update on council directions to date and what's been achieved is uh, contained in the staff report. And we'll go to that after this PowerPoint presentation and tease that apart. So uh, just wanted to remind people about the guiding principles um, with which this whole review has been undertaken. And that is that commissions and committees add important value to council decision making. The district wants to invest in its advisory bodies by providing support and resources to help them be successful in achieving their mandate. Transparency and accountability are paramount across this organization. So um, advisory bodies function as an extension of council's decision making. Meetings are meetings. Uh, we're really striving to uh, support uh, the advisory bodies in having successful and well advertised um, meetings. Again, those have to be posted, there have to be minutes, there has to be, to be a trail of the business undertaken. Clarity of role and mandate, helping to ensure maximum value to members, staff and council. And the realization that commissions and committees receive their authority from council. Again, they exist to augment council's decision making. Their work plans and projects should be council directed and approved. I think one of the things um, that I've seen in my time here is a sense of frustration when uh, self-initiated projects are undertaken by advisory bodies and then there is an uptake because they don't fit into council's strategic planning process, they don't fit into work plans. So we really want to get clear on how we're using the advisory bodies and to make sure their valuable time and efforts are maximized. Um, just one more of these slides. Um, commissions and committees provide input and recommendations on items referred by council and on the technical work of staff. So I think that's another key piece that we have to get really clear is that advisory bodies um, provide comment and insight. Council gets to take those pieces, see if those should augment uh, technical work, but it is your staff that do the technical work. So again, Bruce, uh, when we get to the staff report, can talk a bit about the importance of how that information and direction and input flows from all levels of the organization. Um, the other thing that I've heard sort of uh, anecdotally is that we don't want to uh, restrict creativity or flexibility for the advisory bodies in their work. And I think um, I'll go to the Community Climate Action Working Group uh, and the terms of reference that, that were established for that body. And it really was about creating flexibility. Um, when I know we did those terms of reference really quickly, uh, Councillor Appleton, because you needed to get up and, and running. Uh, and we certainly came together, we're solution oriented, said what does council need? They wanted that ability for flexibility and creativity coming out of that group and those terms of reference reflected that. Same idea if the, the advisory bodies have a creative idea and want to bring that to council to see if there's uptake. We've created a process in the policy that allows them to do that. So again, the idea that, that as we start to define roles or clarify mandates, that that's restricting creativity or flexibility, that's not the intention. We just have to say, well, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? And how much creativity and flexibility does council want? That's also your job to define. The other thing I'm really proud of, um, I'll just go back there, sorry Joanna, is council has committed to regular reviews of its advisory bodies. I think um, 2011 was when the Heritage Commission um, was established. Uh, that represented a shift in how uh, council of the day was doing its business. Um, I think we had uh, the last review for the APC and the ADP in 2015, so you're not seeing as big as shifts uh, with things that are more recently reviewed. I think, again, across the organization as we strive to optimize and modernize, we're not going to see things left um, for years at a time. When there's a need, we come back, we keep it live, we bring it to council and get direction. Um, we also mentioned that with the policies, the fact that 
um, we know that's a big piece of work. It's complicated. We, we committed to bringing that back to council in a year to say, hey, is this actually getting you what you need? Is this resonating with the advisory bodies? Um, we also have committed to providing a robust orientation, support and training to support the effectiveness. So um, some of the uh, council liaisons uh, and chairs of the advisory bodies sat in on a mini respectful workplace session. Um, of course, that's a foundation of this organization. We want to provide that to all of the advisory bodies, chairs, uh, members going forward. There may be other training that council wants to support. Uh, and certainly the orientation uh, is going to be um, a much more robust process now than it has been in the past. So again, that represents council investing in its advisory bodies. I really want to just sort of name the fact that change isn't easy. And I know that there has been a sense of um, apprehension almost about what this change represents. And so I think if we can just clarify, we go back to those guiding principles, we recognize the value of, of the advisory bodies. We say this isn't about change for the sake of change. It's about building on what's working well, and you've got a lot of what's working well, and optimizing where there is opportunity. And I think whether it's advisory bodies or district reporting or any of the other initiatives we currently have on the, on, on, in process, underway, you're seeing that adage applied to um, council's directives, staff's work, and we'd like to uh, continue working on that. So tonight's purpose, uh, we want to ensure that the structure and operation of council committees and commissions reflects effective governance and a positive return on investment for the time and efforts of council members, volunteers, and staff. I don't think anybody's going to say that's not a good idea for, for uh, a local government to undertake. So what are the goals with that? We want to provide you an overview of the updated mandates and membership of uh, the four of the core commissions and committees. We want to give you your first look at those establishing bylaws in terms of reference. And we want to confirm timelines and next steps because I think we need some direction here depending on what council wants to do. Again, those timelines are subject to shift. I'm not going to go too far into this because we're actually, after this presentation, going to flip to the report, which have these current mandate and composition and the proposed mandate and composition contained. So we're going to tease those apart. That's a key part of Council's work tonight. Um, but just to sort of get it up here on the, on the slide to talk about, there's some shifts in membership. One of the things that we're doing uh, is proposing a seven membership um, composition across the board. Uh, that reflects what you currently have in place as far as actual numbers on the ground. It just doesn't align with uh, some of your terms of reference and establishing bylaws. And when we talk about the mandates and duties, we're digging in a little bit. Uh, one of the, the key changes, uh, I'll hold that thought because I think it comes up in a slide. We'll skip one more. Additional note, so proposed changes um, to the Heritage Commission really talks about putting the focus on land use applications. Uh, when we were doing the um, interviews and the, the, the uh, meeting with the bodies, there was confusion over what the foundation was doing, and I think the foundation was originally established in 1992, and then what the Heritage Commission was doing, which was established in, in 2011. So the attempt was to actually differentiate between what the Heritage Commission is doing, staff are recommending that that focuses on land use applications and associated um, policies and other pieces. Uh, and then the Heritage Foundation, which is actually established as a society and has a lot more flexibility in how it can undertake its work, uh, focuses on heritage awareness, public education, community events, and special projects. So those would shift to the Heritage Foundation. The great thing about them being a society is that they don't have the same rules for how they have to convene their meetings. So um, we all know as we try to, um, uh, say, uh, go out into a, a community event or things like that, um, how much of that is a meeting and how much is that is just going forth and fulfilling the, the mandate of the foundation. So we have to talk a little bit about that. 
Um, we want to, to eliminate the overlap and provide role clarity uh, with the findings of the Commission to date. And there's also the matter of a financial overlap um, that came up during the review. And so right now, the way the foundation works, it actually has to apply for a grant every year. And one of the things that we've proposed is to actually um, discontinue how funding is currently done and shift it to a fee for service agreement. And a lot of people s don't understand necessarily what a fee for service agreement is. And that would actually represent certainty in funding over the long term. So right now, there's a finite amount of grants. Um, people come in, they have to apply for a grant. So, so the foundation has to make application for a grant. If you move to a fee for service, they wouldn't have to do that. Council would get, still get a reporting on the activities undertaken and how the funding was spent but you wouldn't have to apply for a grant and they'd know there was consistent funding year over year. Um, it's also unclear why uh, it flows, the funding for the foundation flows through the commission. So I believe, I don't, I think Christopher is still in the building to talk more about a fee for service agreement, but I know Bruce can also talk a little bit about how the way that funding flows is unnecessarily complicated. So again, not about uh, compromising the great work that the foundation does. It's actually doing the opposite. It's saying, hey, we recognize the value of the foundation and the value it brings to the community. How can we provide it with more uh, financial certainty while also streamlining the process for it? Um, there was some uh, public correspondence that came in. Um, one of the concerns was the fee for service agreement. I, that would clearly had to be included in tonight's presentation. There were questions about that. There was also some um, questions about the connection to the heritage plan and it being a mandate for the heritage commission. And I thought that's really interesting. So we teased that ap ap apart, uh, sorry. And um, really, we have to recognize that the Heritage Plan is a guiding community document, and that was adopted in 2013. So that contains policies or projects for implementation that Council might refer to the Heritage Commission. Um, but again, it's not a, a mandate document for the Heritage Commission. It's really a policy document for the community and for Council that they could direct the Heritage Commission to weigh in on. They'd participate in a review. If there were projects for implementation in there, they'd weigh in on those things. Uh, so I thought that needed clarity. And then we also wanted to, again, provide assurance that there were mechanisms uh, laid out in the policy um, whereby a committee or commission could make a recommendation to council. And ideally, we would see that timed uh, in consideration with budget and strategic planning. So we would find a way to stream that brainstorming into council's decision-making plan because, again, there's, there's potential impacts to work plan. Uh, advisory Planning Commission, uh, not a lot of change on this one. This is, again, a little bit more detail. Uh, we're looking at that seven volunteer composition. I'll get you to skip forward, Joanna, sorry. Uh, and one more, one more. Um, this is where it gets a little different. And so the advisory design panel was set up as a committee. And one of the things that I've heard council say clearly is that it doesn't want to weigh in on land use applications, which is what the ADP actually deals with. Um, so what we're proposing is that this is actually set up as a second advisory planning commission. Um, we'll probably still use the acronyms ADP and APC for clarity, but the key point here is how is the body established? And it would be established as a commission, which means uh, people will council liaisons wouldn't be voting on, on the land matters contained therein. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about more about that in the staff report. Um, the Director of Building and Planning did weigh in with uh, the Architectural Institute of BC to see if they had any concerns with this structure. Uh, again, they didn't. So based on what we've heard from council and their concerns about voting, this will be our recommendation going forward. Uh, we'll skip to the next one. 
Public Art Advisory Committee, this was a really interesting one and it's why I sat in on, on the meeting uh, the other day is, is to find a way to, to provide support. I gave them a, an informal update, talked about this meeting tonight. But this advisory committee has experienced change in that um, the uh, Parks, Rec and Culture Committee uh, or commission is no longer standing. So we also have to help this group understand how they get direction from council and how they get information to council. So again, I would anticipate um, providing additional support as we uh, iron out some wrinkles with this group to make them really comfortable in the process. One more, Joanna. So commissions and committees, the other thing that we heard throughout the review is that um, there was a frustration if there was no business at hand that meetings were getting cancelled. So, you know, we haven't convened for months and months what's going on. And I think as we go out to, to recruit and orient a new group of people, um, staff's recommendation is that we actually commit to a minimum of three meetings in a year. The first would be um, an orientation. Then we would see a mid-year update with the council liaison uh, playing a strong role with the staff liaison support. And then we would see an end of year wrap up. So at minimum, you would have three meetings and then you would have other meetings with business arising. Again, when we go back to that guiding principle of advisory bodies exist to augment council's decision-making, council has to figure that piece out. But we wanted to provide some certainty that um, people would be convened and there would be uh, involvement and engagement with council. We also talked about doing the um, uh, mid-year review of the commissions and committees policy and uh, council can also build in an opportunity for advisory body mandate review. Uh, again, if we, we don't want to leave things sitting for years and years if, uh, it's, if the need of council has changed. Okay. Um, this is another sort of common ground uh, piece that we talked about. So I don't think anybody would hold up their hand and say, I object to the best advisory bodies having clear roles and responsibilities. I think we have an obligation to provide that. Um, they're well run. They're efficient. Uh, they understand their mandate. They do their part to ensure a respectful workplace. And again, I think part of that is uh, reinforcing those kinds of things with uh, training. Um, and we want to maximize the return on investment for the district and those volunteer members. Again, this is about investing. We also want to talk about return on investment in the context of um, realizing that advisory bodies because they're important to council's decision making, council invests heavily in these bodies when you think about staff time and capacity. So um, we put our heads together and I know the first time you saw this number um, was in the consultant's report, but I think it's also important for the members and the public tier as well is that we're estimating uh, a minimum of 10 to 15 hours of staff time to prepare and host uh, an advisory body meeting. And so when you think about um, putting together agendas, posting on the website, posting on the board, taking minutes, providing staff reports, going back and forth with applicants on feedback that the advisory body gives and how that changes the staff report, these are a significant investment. Again, council has decided we want that investment. We just have to be clear on what that looks like. There's also additional time that isn't slotted into that allocation. So for example, um, IT has been helping in set up the, uh, as we've shifted to a COVID response, uh, we've had IT involved. Uh, we've been looking at, of course, at our big policy pieces. Uh, we're about to undertake recruiting, orientation, there's tracking, filing, reporting out. There's the role that finance plays in budget. When I talk about streamlining, <laughs> The, the financial process between the foundation and commission, that's good business. It has a cost to it when we talk about the finance department. Um, and I think the other thing is, is I don't want council, the public, or the advisory bodies to think when we talk about a return on investment or when we talk about staff time, that isn't us 
as staff saying we don't recognize the value in advisory bodies. We do. We just need to give council the information to say when you add or take away advisory bodies, there's impacts. And we just want to be really candid about that. So timing, process, next steps. Uh, we would move to see um, bylaws, establishing bylaws in terms of reference adopted. Um, moving into recruitment and appointment of volunteer members and then holding orientation sessions. So staff are currently working on those pieces behind the scene, but council has some choices about timing that we need your direction on. So one of the things that was uh, posed is should council put the mandates of this back to the uh, membership in the same way that you did when you started this review so the idea that you let individual members weigh in on their experience of uh, the advisory body and when you look at the mandate the way we've laid it out what's currently proposed uh, or what currently exists and what is proposed, does council want to send the, that mandate out to individual members to allow them to comment? If you do, it's going to impact your timelines, which again is fine. It's just about having a candid conversation and we'll have to do another piece of correspondence out to the advisory body members to keep them in the loop. So if you wanted uh, additional input, it extends it by about a month. Um, without additional input, we can probably get you there with volunteer orientations and first meetings in January. If you want this to go back, uh, allow time um, for us to get the information out to the members and then get that members back, member information back, then we bring that to a meeting, you're adding about a month. Again, staff is supportive uh, any way council wants to proceed, we just need that direction. So what we're hoping for tonight, um, because this is the first time you've seen these establishing bylaws and the terms of reference, are there any changes that you see right out of the gate that you would like? And then do you need that additional individual input from current advisory body volunteers on the mandates of their um, respective bodies? Uh, finally, uh, before we go to the staff report, I'd really like to uh, extend uh, on behalf of staff and the council a uh, sincere thank you to our commission and committee volunteers for their invaluable time, their expertise, and their dedication to our community. And I know we have probably a fair number of them watching from home, so again, uh, a sincere thank you. Um, so we could go to the, the uh, staff report. I will be relying on my fabulous team over here uh, to support me in this. And uh, over to you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Ms. Varela. And uh, yeah, I, it's certainly been a strange year for committees and commissions, way above and beyond the, 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 the work that we're doing here, just in terms of not being able to meet and, and everything else. So certainly appreciate their patience as we get to this and uh, try and come up with something very workable. I um, want to just make it clear for those uh, here and those at home what the process is going to be on this tonight as well. So we're going to go through these. Um, uh, we're going to uh, move to questions uh, of council. We're going to go through each of these individually. We'll go through questions of council. Um, we, at the end of that process, we're going to go about to, um, uh, which is, should not take too, too long, but we'll go through that. We'll take public input. And then we'll come back and look if there's any recommendations of council for changes and uh, if there's just consensus that's straightforward, if there's, it may have to require some motions, if there's something substantial um, to change or if there's anything substantial work required for, uh, for more information. But I think we're in pretty good shape here to go through things. Um, but I just want to let you know, we'll ask questions, we'll get some clarification. Um, and then we'll go to the public for any for feedback. We've got some correspondence already. And then we'll come back to this table and start delving into a bit more detail. Fair enough. Uh, Ms. Rella. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so there is a status update on those 18 recommendations contained in the report. Uh, staff welcome any questions that uh, council or the public has on that, but I won't um, belabor those, those points. They're there for the reading. Uh, there are uh, the four bodies we're dealing with tonight for additional clarification. The Heritage Commission, the Advisory Planning Commission, Land Use, uh, the advisory, your new advisory planning commission maybe, uh, the design panel, and the public art advisory committee. 
Thank you. If, I think it's probably easy if we go to the main agenda item and move to the to the pieces here. We have um, the sections, pages six to nine, which covers the changes, and uh, we'll take questions from uh, members of council on any of those pieces. Uh, I think it's probably. I'm sure there's gonna be some clarification required or some some comments, but uh, so I just suggest that's a logical place to go is to page six where it gets to the Heritage Commission, and. Uh, I'll turn to our members of the committee for any comments or questions, or really with questions at this point as much as possible. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I guess I must admit, Ms. Rell, I, I did, in reading, reading this through, and I thank you for some of your clarifications, I did find um, uh, the way it, what is proposed is quite restrictive compared to how heritage has been viewed in o in Oak Bay. Um, and I guess as I, I look at it, I really have to, I think we have to decide how we are going to deal with um, uh, what we want, detailing what we want from the commission and what we want from the foundation so that we, uh, you know, we don't leave gaps. We have, I think we can all admit in Oak Bay, we have some, uh, a very good program of heritage. We don't, we don't want to diminish that in, in any way. So it's very important that we consider that. Um, and one comment I have on that is that there is a real value to having at least two members of the Heritage Commission beyond the foundation or, or vice versa, so that we have um, a shared knowledge um, and historical reference. Heritage, as <laughs> as is inferred by its its, its title of heritage, it, it's long-lasting. It, it, there's a continuum there. But I, I guess my concern um, really harkens back to the 2019 um, Heritage BC conference that I attended. And that, uh, in 2019, BC, Heritage BC convened um, workshops in 26 communities around the province. So that was a very robust consultation about um, heritage in general throughout the province and in, in individual communities. Um, and out of that, there was a lot of discussion and g some very general themes that came out of it. Uh, the leading theme was that the drivers of heritage in the province are the volunteer leaders and not the heritage experts. The heritage experts actually had a very diminished role um, and that there has been a shift to recognizing the broader values with less emphasis on statements of significance. Um, and heritage is really what matters to the community and an expansion to include archaeological, built, natural arts, culture, and, and economy. So those visioning uh, tools that that many communities are already starting to work with, we haven't had discussions on here, and certainly from the mandate that is presented for the Heritage Commission, it's how, where we fit that in and, and how we do that. The Heritage Foundation, of course, has a very valuable role, but they are, um, as was pointed out in the presentation, um, a distinct group, a separate body from council, and they really are m very much self-directed rather than council-directed. So if we look at what um, Heritage BC saw as the future of heritage and how that rolls out in the communities, then how, when this is so driven by, it's driven really by land development applications, how do we still um move the whole program forward how do we how do we harness the great energy that we have right now in those volunteer bodies to achieve that and at the same time um provide the input 
from council of where we where we want to go. So th that's not clear in the way this is presented, and so perhaps there can be some discussion around that. Maybe we have to bring it, you know, move it forward more, but at least if we can have some preliminary dis discussion, it'll help. Uh, thank you, Councilor Patterson. I'll, I'm gonna take that to a couple of questions, because um, I think it's always helpful to kind of ask questions and see if we can get answers. Um, one was the question of, uh, in this establishing bylaw, there's seven regular members. Um, there's no mention in there. Is it possible to add something to, you know, as a guidance thing to seek uh, overlap in membership with the foundation as part of our piece without binding us in any way? Uh, Your Worship, I don't feel it's necessary in these documents because council makes those decisions when they're appointing. So again, you could council could set for itself that it would like to have uh, total cross um, population of those advisory bodies with the same people. You might decide that you would like an overlap of two. You might decide that you want them totally distinct from each other. So again, I don't think there's anything in this that actually um, negates or enforces one approach over the other. I think council makes that decision when it appoints. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I would see that if, this, if the intention here is to move the back and forth a bit, then I can certainly see Councillor Patterson's point to that. And, and there, so there may be some value in, in formalizing that, but we'll have to come to that. And the other question I took out of your comments, Councillor Patterson, was um, how do things like visioning documents, um, wh how, what would be the process if, uh, well, the, the heritage plan is a good example of, of that. So uh, if something that was going to be worked on by the, 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 the Heritage Commission saw as valuable, uh, not necessarily on our radar because we're not living and breathing it every day. How would that get raised to our awareness? Have the, the blessing yes go work on that, and then and then go have that as a formal document within our uh, process within our our process. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So staff recognize that as important both for the advisory bodies and clarifying the flow of information. So you actually endorse that in the policy that you adopted in July. Is that uh, the body is free to. Um, make recommendations they would raise the item at a meeting uh, and then that item would be referred to through a staff report or a memo depending how complex it was uh, to council for their direction so again it's not restricting uh, the ideas that could be brought forward what we're saying is to streamline um, communication and to maximize efficiencies we'd like to say council actually endorses those actions so for example if the heritage commission would like to see um, a revamp of the 2013 heritage plan um, we wouldn't see the heritage commission going and self-initiating that we would say we would like to say at a meeting they would make that recommendation that recommendation is brought to council Council makes that that decision and provides staff direction. So again, it's not it's not restricting the flow of information. It's just clarifying how that information flows. So um, again, I, I I referred to the idea of um, uh, self initiating. So for in the form of a uh, a checklist or something like that, if a group goes off and puts great effort and energy into a great idea. Um, but then there's no uptake for any variety of reasons. I would experience that as frustrating if I was a member. Whereas if we can streamline the idea that all the creativity in the world can, can be brought to the council table for consideration, council endorses and then provides, provides those um, marching orders to staff or the commission, however it uh, flows out. So again, not restricting, just clarifying flow. Does that help, Councillor Patterson? Councilor Patterson? It, it does help, um, although that, that, you know, that isn't how, um, that isn't how it has actually functioned over this past year. Um, and because, and it still is, if, if, if we're meeting only if there are land applications as opposed to a meeting to discuss the visioning. Um, it's hard sometimes to do it at the same meeting. We're limiting the meetings to two hours. We're we're um, focusing them on land applications, and then 
we are to work on this too, or would that be, or, or, or is what is recommended or advised, is that going to a separate meeting where we would put this together? So because we're t trying to work within the time constraints and and uh, and what kind of the mandate is that's here. Ms. Brilla? Uh Your Worship. So, Council, if you look under uh, Bullet 3 on page 6 on the right-hand column, um, it, pretty, pretty broad category there. So it's not just land use applications. It could also be district plans, strategies, or other regulatory initiatives for input and advice to Council pertaining to heritage conservation, including planning initiatives related to conservation areas, um, so again, we, we, it's not just a particular land use application, it's all those other pieces, those policy pieces, those regulatory pieces, those project pieces related to land use as well. Thank you. I think particularly related to council business is the key part there. So things that are related to council business. Council, Councillor Green? Thank you. Um, just a question, though, related to what Councillor Patterson just raised. How, how do you see the work getting done in three meetings a year? I, I'm actually taken aback by that, I have to say, because we will never retain or sustain volunteers if we're only meeting three times a year. Is that what you intended, or no, I'm was sorry. I wrong? No, I'm sorry, Your Worship. So, for example, the APC has expressed frustration in the past because they didn't get enough land use applications to meet regularly. So it was really the APC I was thinking about. It would be nice to give them a minimum. Um, I, the Heritage Commission and uh, the design panel certainly meet more frequently. And then, uh, depending on the decisions council makes with art pieces and how it wants um, to to flow those out again, will determine meeting schedule. So no, um, I certainly don't see the Heritage Commission meeting three times a year, Your Worship. So I apologize for the confusion. It was more of a, at minimum, any advisory body, whether it's those that are on the ground right now or a new one that council might create, should at least be guaranteed um, uh, three meetings a year and provided updates on council's strategic planning and, and those sorts of things. So um, bare bones, don't anticipate that's applicable to the Heritage Commission. Uh, may I um, Go ahead, carry Councilor. on? I, I also had circulated questions earlier this morning to Ms. Morrison, and thank you very much for your response. Um, and I believe everybody got a copy, but the public won't be aware of those. Do you want me to quickly just say what those questions were? Yeah, I think I think the point of questions I think should always be a: Are we? Is it? Do you need the answer to get a good decision? And b: If they're thinking they're of general interest to the population, um, for clarification, then those are both really worthwhile. So absolutely, just go ahead. As you okay, see thank you. Uh, my first question was three point one under the mandate statement in the bylaw. Um, the term including, quote unquote, in the opening sentence does not, does that suggest that the mandate could be expanded to include additional items beyond the existing A, B, C, and D? And this is the mandate of the Heritage Commission. Um, and Ms. Morstan responded with uh, very complete answers, thank you. Um, her response to that was for now, yes. This would include the items listed in 3.1a through 3.1d, notably, some of these have intentionally been left very general, allowing for enhanced council discretion flexibility in referring matters to the commission. Also, council could, of course, at any time amend the mandate within the establishing bylaws. So thank you for that answer. My second question had to do with 4.2, and that was membership. Uh, for matters unrelated to land use, the council liaison will have full voting privileges and membership rights pursuant to the community charter. Can you please provide an example of a matter unrelated to land use, given that it seems clear from the draft mandate that the commission will be restricted to land use matters referred to the commission by council and or staff? Can you please cite the specific section of the community charter that sets out voting privileges for council members serving as commission committee council liaisons? I was unable to locate any specific wording in the charter sections that I reviewed. And finally, um, for your information, voting practice is not a provincial standard 
a practice by all municipalities. So I researched that the cities of Vancouver, Pitt Meadows, Richmond, and Victoria do not have voting privileges for their council liaisons. And I admitted in my note to Sarah that I have a, I'm sorry, Ms. Morrison, I have a, a bias about this one because uh, I believe that voting privileges for council liaisons could potentially lead to a com compromise of commission independence, confusion for volunteers, politicize issues at the commission table, and compromise the councillor role as an elected official when making final decisions on commission matters at the table, council table. Shall I keep going? <laughs> There's only one more after this. Um, so M Ms. Morrison responded, this particular item is in keeping with the voting structure approved as part of the committee and commission policy. And I recall questioning that issue at the time and requesting um, a response back on the issue of voting. So I, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall having approved that straight away, but I might be wrong. Um, and examples um, of non-use items could include more general policy or community planning discussions, development of policy tools such as checklists, etc. If this is something that is of significant immediate concern, a legal opinion specific to the commission voting could be sought. So that was the response. Thank you. And my, well, I have two final questions. They're quite long, though. Um, do you want me to go on? Can you maybe just do a quick summary of the questions and the answers? Yeah, just quickly. Um, 5.3 was the appointment process in terms of commission members, and that was just a question around timing. And Ms. Morrison explained that in some detail, so uh, I was certainly satisfied with the answer. Um, and the final one was section 6.5 on meeting procedures. And this was around canceling a regular meeting or scheduling a special meeting requires the approval of the CAO. And I had suggested that in the absence of the CAO, CAO it would be good, a good idea to have a contingency plan for a designate. Um, Ms. Morrison assured me that that is covered off in our, our procedural bylaws. So those are my questions and those were the answers. And thanks again. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. I, it's probably worth just reiterating because this is a topic of a lot of conversation in 2019 and again uh, more recently in the spring uh, when we had this conversation about the necessity for voting um, and within the select committees versus the standing committees and Council's role in those. So um, a few different faces around the table, but maybe it's just worth, because my, my recollection of this is that the legal advice we got on this one was very clear that the Local Government Act was clear that that was why we had to make these, these recommendations, but perhaps Ms. Varela or Ms. Morden can speak to that. Uh, Your Worship, so for greater clarity uh, with regards to uh, commission or committees, not commissions, the relevant provisions of the community charter, each council member has one vote on any question. Each council member present at the time of a vote must vote on the matter. The voting rules established by this section also apply to council committees. So that's why uh, in the responses to the queries today, we said we could find additional information if the concern was on voting at the commission. Um, but again, we established or proposed to establish the design panel so that the council member wouldn't be voting on land use matters, which is the same as the um, APC. Go ahead, Councillor Green. My follow-up question, though, when I researched these four municipalities, I looked specifically at their commission structure, and and the council liaison is a non-voting member. So I, you know, I I am concerned about this. I will remain concerned about this. I think it's. Um, I think it's a risk, and I think uh, for me, it's it's um, it's it's not good best practice. That's that's my own opinion. I realize, and I don't mean to uh, you know doubt the opinion of staff. It's not that. It's just that I don't think it's a best practice uh, for the reasons I stated. So that that's why I, I'm raising it again. So I think it's going to go back to staff just for clarification. Go ahead, Councilor. Well, I, I was just seeking some clarification, Your Worship. So is the is the concern about the committees or the commissions? It's about the commissions. 
and, and that's why staff offered to get additional input today if council isn't ready to make a decision on that voting structure tonight. So right. if, if you're not liking what's proposed, which is council doesn't vote on land use related matters, um, but votes on other uh, matters, then we'll come back to you with further information. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And we were very clear that anything that's a committee, council has to vote on unless it's... Uh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Green? <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there other questions on the heritage piece, Councillor Braithwaite? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, the, the heritage one is the one that I'm having the most difficulty with, I have to be honest. Um, and um, some of that comes from um, part of the recommendation that states the timing in there. I find that timing really, really hard. Like if we happen to go with A, it says that we'll, we'll get um, uh, information back from the advisory body volunteers for individual comment by November 4th. Well, that's two weeks. I, I don't know whether that's, that's enough time for them to actually, you know, come together and, and give their, their input. So I, I would question the dates a little bit, perhaps. That might be too quick as far as I'm concerned. Let's just, can we just tell these the questions so we can get answers on those? Because I think that's a, a point. Okay. So it, it, is it possible to change those dates? Uh, Your Worship, uh, absolutely. Staff staff serve at the pleasure of council, so w of course the timeline is yours. Staff, when we put the report together, we strive for the most compressed timeline with the idea that council has really been pushing for this, but we'll take direction accordingly. The other suggestion from staff is that you aren't going back to ask the bodies to vote on their mandate. You're asking for the individual input of members, so we distribute to individual members in the same way that we did the survey to make sure everyone had a voice and that uh, individual input wasn't lost in the voting structure of an advisory body. So that also allows for a more compressed timeline, but again, um, we'll take instruction from council to adjust accordingly. Thank you. And then um, I know that there was some um, correspondence in regards to the Heritage Commission part, and there was one piece of correspondence that came in that says, that said something, and I, I, would, I would agree that this particular the way that this um, uh, the Heritage Commission one is written out that it seems very restrictive and it um, puts an undo unduly limits the potential contributions of expert volunteers on this body to council and I kind of felt that same way too so I'm wondering um, if you have any comment on that if you uh, you know is there a way that we could make it less restrictive um, there's things that are not I, I don't see anywhere included in here which would be like the statements of significance or something like that like where does that fall Ms. Rella uh, I'll actually defer to the director of planning on this one because I know he has lived experience with the statements of significance so over to you Bruce uh, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anderson. I think the broader question of here as well is, is this question of expertise and how do we harness that effectively in the process that's laid out here of referral and, and, and back? Yeah, I, th I think, if I may, the uh, revised or the, the, the new establishing bylaw for the Heritage Commission does provide for continued um, application or input of expertise by commission members collaborating with staff on, for example, preparation of statements of significance or nominating properties to be considered for the Heritage Register. That really doesn't change significantly. Um, I think it might just be a matter of it's something that occurs in a collaborative way with staff providing basically the technical support and seeking input and advice um, from the commission members as part of that process. So there's a bit of a shift there from it not solely coming, um, I guess, or, or emerging from work that the commission might do independently on, on items like that, but it's a, more a matter of, are we going to be look, considering a property on a register? Is there a need for a statement of significance? Um, is that gonna be drafted and then is that gonna be reviewed and, and augmented, for example, by the commission members as part of a process with the commission and staff working on a recommendation that would go to council. So it's um, a bit of a revamp, but uh, the work together is still uh, embedded in this in this uh, bylaw. Councillor Braithwaite? Uh, yeah, I'll let someone else go and come back to me, maybe. Yeah. Are there other questions at this point? 
Seems to be the, the, the more most complicated of the bunch, so go ahead, Councillor Zalka. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, one uh, uh, way that, uh, that, with respect to the Heritage Commission, that would help me understand is, is uh, maybe by walking through um, very, bri very briefly uh, uh, an example. Um, for example, if, um, if a, uh, um, a designation, it came, heritage designation came forward, um, as, as happened a couple of weeks ago, um, where we got all the way to second reading before, uh, before we voted it down. Would, the Her would, would, would it be anticipated that the Heritage Commission would be um, uh, weighing in on that before it gets to Council for first or second reading, or would it have to get to second reading passed first, and then we refer to all the uh, various commissions? I mean, wh where, where are we anticipating this tying in with the changes that we're anticipating on the first, second, and third readings now? Sure. Thank you, Councillor Zalka. I'll go to Mr. Anderson for that. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, with, with an active commission, uh, we would see an opportunity uh, under, say, a temporary protection order condition like we had recently where there could be a, a referral to the Heritage Commission and, and ask uh, for their recommendation with respect to designation. So um, that's something that could be in place um, with, with this bylaw or under the previous um, bylaw as well. You can still have the commission inputting to council when considering a, a designation on a property. Um, so that sounds like it would be um, at the will of council, whether we do it at the first reading or at second reading, or we do it uh, as part of the 60-day process? Yes. For, uh, for example, uh, readings of a, a designation bylaw would would send that bylaw to a public hearing and as part of the consultation associated with leading up to a public hearing, you could seek the commission's uh, a recommendation or advice on that. Um, uh, so so where, where are some of the, uh, um, I, 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 I really appreciate how um, staff is working hard to make sure we have absolutely wonderful good governance here, except Oak Bay has never done it this way before. So this is a real bit of a change, at least in my experience. Um, by shifting everything to, the, to do the work after second reading, which many of us are used to be that being the end of the process and here but sorry i don't think that was the answer given so maybe some more clarification well, from mr anderson uh, that, that's what wish. it sounds like it is though so maybe i'll get a bit more clarification from mr anderson and so to uh, Councilor zelka can you explain you're talking about a situation like we had recently where there was a 60-day protection order and then a Please, or just a, a designation process, a more more standard i'm, I'm using that just as an example but let's use I, as an I, example. i'm an engineer i like i like examples so which, which example? Do you want to do both, an emergency one and a, uh, and a standard one? Yes. Okay. Mr. Anderson, can you sort of walk us through what it would look like? I think it's pretty much identical to what it is right now, but I'll turn it over to you. So in a, in a normal heritage designation process, uh, what, would be the, what would be the referral process and how would that information come to council? And in an emergency where there was a 60-day protection order, how would that process come to council? Well, well, in, in both instances, uh, the Heritage Commission can be involved in making a recommendation to Council on that designation. Uh, I'm under a, I mean, there are several normal processes for a designation. It could be something initiated by the owner. It could be something that's solicited by uh, the, the Commission or by Council. So, you know, there are, there are several variations on the theme. But uh, I guess the key point is that uh, for uh, consideration of a designation, um, if that's initiated under what we'll call a typical process, that's something that would, would sort of flow through uh, the commission and staff on its way to council for consideration of, of that bylaw. So we, we get ourselves into the situation we had before where we had a temporary protection order in place um, and we had um, some previous work done respecting heritage on a property that was reviewed by the Heritage Commission. At, at that type of process uh, and without a, a commission regularly meeting, Council proceeded with consideration of first and second reading. What we would have probably in a, a, a more uh, typical scenario like that is that we would have, um, as part of that temporary protection order process, uh, an opportunity for Council to seek uh, advice and recommendation from the Commission as you head toward consideration of first and second reading of the bylaw. But I don't, this, this re recent one isn't a good comparison, I guess, for, for what we might normally do in a uh, temporary protection order scenario. Hope that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. It, Mr. it is helpful. Councilor Thank Zalka. you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, 
in the context of, of, of this um, sort of work here, I just wanted to, to confirm um, through you, of course, to staff, um, that uh, is the intention for us to do the bulk of this, these referral works between or after second reading? Because I understand there's a, there's a desire to change uh, the way we've been dealing with second reading. Quite often we just zoom right through second reading, go straight to the to final reading because everything's already been referred. But are we moving things uh, closer to between first and second, or between second and public hearing? Is that when we refer to count to uh, the commission, Mr. Anderson? If I may, I think the short answer is no. Um, we're, we're not we're not proposing any change. I also, we're we're talking about um, I think perhaps the process of getting ourselves to a place where council would be considering uh, bylaw readings for designation of a property. And, and that's one that involves, as I noted, uh, staff and commission recommendations and advice to council on, on that consideration. So we're, I don't, we're not talking about trying to change the, the process or move the mechanics of whether input is provided uh, after first reading or, or second reading. I, I, as I said in the previous uh, comment, as we lead up to consideration of bylaw readings, we seek input, uh, council seeks input from staff and, and the commission as you go to that place. It's not um, in the process following uh, readings of a bylaw that you would, you would seek uh, further staff and commission input, typically. Thank you, Councilor Zelka. Uh, are there other questions from uh, council on this, on the heritage piece? I, I'll go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Lengthy, lengthy discussions here, but heritage is obviously a topic that is of great interest around the table and very important to the community. Um, just, you, you know, um, something in looking at the way it is presented, it makes sense that the, um, the staff person who uh, liaises with and and um, has responsibility from a staff perspective on heritage comes from the uh, building and planning uh, department. And that makes sense when we look at the focus being on applications. However, uh, when we look at the visioning aspects of it, um, it comes back to the use of staff time. And so I can see why why this is written the way it is, and it, it makes sense from that. But is the representative of the building and planning department um, the right interface for the Heritage Commission, um, and maybe the Heritage Foundation, depending on how this is split, but for items of the visioning and what is important uh, to the community, what, what, how the community values heritage. How does the staff um, bring value to the meeting from that, you know, that perspective? That, that could use up a lot of staff time from the building and planning department, and I don't know if that really is kind of part of their job description, so to speak, or um, if there's a different way around that. Uh, Ms. Rella? Uh, so, Your Worship, uh, how I would see that playing out is Council would say, I would like the Heritage Commission to undertake a visioning process. And so, Council might decide that they want um, a, a, a team to do it. You might use a consultant. Um, you would certainly um, still have your planning staff involved. Uh, they bring, again, a, a, a level of technical expertise. Um, you might have corporate services involved. You might have, um, so again, it's one of those, but the idea is, does council identify a need? Do they refer it through staff to the commission? Staff make sure it's a properly convened meeting, facilitate the meeting either with their own expertise or, or another body if council wants that, and then a recommendation comes back or a product comes back to council. So again, is this a council endorsed activity, whether it's visioning or just pick project X? The idea is it should be a product that council is looking for. Councilor Patterson. 
Thank you, Mayor. That that's that's helpful information to have. Um, and just following on on that, then, um, I guess I can interpret this two ways. I can interpret it as as uh, something that would be done, perhaps on an annual basis, with the body, rather than I can, You know, we're not going to go back and forth each time, and and then create a lot of um, visioning items coming from the commission, and then it has to be come before council. Council says, yes, go ahead, or, or no. I mean, for, for efficiency, expediency in this, how do we see this practically rolling out? <laughs> Ms. Rella? So I think, I think the whole challenge, and if I go back to Councillor Zelka's point, this isn't the way things have been done. Right, um, it's been very ad hoc. Uh, we've heard clearly from the membership that we need clarification of roles and responsibilities. But again, those are council's decisions. If you don't like what you see before you, staff respectfully defer to you for your clear direction on how you want to see this happen. Based on what we've heard to date, um, we're talking about we needed to uh, clarify the flow of information Council uh, provides direction through staff to the commission. The commission provides a recommendation back to council. Just the same way that information flows between council and staff, there's, there's a process. And so whether you like this process or another process, staff respectfully defer to you. Um, all we have to do is pick a process. So that's what's the problem right now is to date since 2011, it's been ad hoc. It's been one way for this and one way for this. Of course there's, there's confusion. Um, we just want to clarify the process and we take council instructions. So I don't want this to, to appear as something staff is imposing this. Council provided direction for 18 recommendations to go review uh, committees and commissions because you thought that was a valuable investment in time. So if the product before you is something that you want to see adapted, staff will absolutely take that direction. We just need clear direction. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rella. I have a couple more uh, questions, but I just want to be respectful. A couple of things of time. One, we actually have to have a motion to extend because we're coming up on 1030, and I think we don't want to go too late, but we really do need to get through at least uh, some direction here at this meeting. Um, and second, and then I'll, I have a couple of quick questions, and then I would go to, at that point, to, to the public. Uh, so if you're waiting in the public to talk, this will be the chance, 598 Three three one one two five zero five nine eight three three one one, and then we'll come back to this table again after that. But we need to have some chance for the public to, to call in. Uh, Councillor Green, do you want me to make a motion to extend? Yeah, I think I don't think we should go past eleven personally, but we'll just maybe make that motion for now. Okay, I will make a, a motion to extend our meeting to eleven p.m. Second, not past eleven. Sorry, yes. not past <laughs> up to eleven p.m. Not past. Okay, thank you. Motion second. <laughs> seconded. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and opposed. Okay, so we have a bit more time. Um, I have a couple quick questions just tied on to that. I appreciate the answer for the last one because that was one of my, um, yeah, I know it's, it's very helpful. I think I could certainly foresee that we build, we ask them to build, and I don't, I don't know if it should be here or not, but uh, at the, you know, towards the end of the year that they provide to council their any, any priorities that they have, so that would flow into our strategic planning process and then into our budgeting process. And I use the Heritage uh, Plan as a really good example. That was a plan developed by the Heritage Commission, but it, it, it outsourced the, the, the expertise to Stuart Stark and provided that piece into that, right? So that's a very rational piece, but if we're going to spend the money and assign the time, then we need to make sure that's approved. Um, so I think I can certainly see, I don't know if that would be in here, if that's rational or not, or if that would just be part of our, our operational piece of that. Um, the other piece I have is just really the clarification for under this model, how research gets done. You have to go? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Councilor Ney. Um, how the research would happen is for things, so like SOS research. Would that, is there ability in here for the commission, uh, say they had a piece of interest to refer that to the foundation at all, or is that, are, they, are they really arm's length in terms of their communication back and forth? Does that all flow through? Because we don't have any direct communication from Council to the foundation typically, but there might be some shared uh, pieces there that might influence that. Has there been thought put to that? 
Uh, ideally, Your Worship, we uh, wouldn't um, encourage advisory bodies to refer uh, to each other. So if Council wanted to refer an item to the Heritage Commission and the Heritage Foundation, they could do so. If there was an item they wanted to refer to the Advisory Planning Commission and the Heritage Commission, you would do so. Um, the process gets confusing when um, advisory bodies start to refer because referral is a, a governance decision and that really should come from the council table. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I know there was some discussion ages ago about this, about putting, uh, actually, you know what, we've, we've discussed it and it's over, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I'll, go to, uh, I'll go to the public at this point. Is there any, I know you have, a, you have a couple of questions still. I don't mind if there can you, if there are just a couple of minutes if we can uh, get to those. It was actually pretty quick. Um, number one, um, I think going back to a question that Councillor Zelka asked, and um, Mr. Anderson gave a really succinct response. Um, it may be something like that could be used, um, you know, as maybe um, like a, uh, like as a footnote or something for uh, in the bylaw, just so that it's giving more of an explanation to the public. Um, and then I, I honestly feel like right now that the Heritage Commission one is the one out of all of this great work that staff has done that we seem to have the most questions on. I mean, for me personally, the rest of them are all pretty darn good, um, and I wouldn't see any changes in them. But the Heritage one, I just feel that we haven't flushed it out the way it should be. And I'm thinking that I wouldn't feel comfortable passing that one tonight without getting more input um, from around this table and perhaps from um, the Heritage Commission as well. Um, just because I just I, I feel that I'm, I'm hearing from most people that have spoken so far that they have some concern over this particular one. Um, I don't mean to put words in the mouths of my of my colleagues, but that's what I'm hearing from the people who have spoken. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I. That's what I'm hearing. So, thank you for that, Councilor Braithwaite. And I think the more we can articulate clearly what it is that 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 we'd like to see uh, addressed, that's that's helpful. And I don't know if it would even preclude us from referring this with those comments to the to the members, because we could take those comments back for our next consideration at the next committee of the whole, if that's the will of the council. Uh, Councilor Green. Are you taking <clears throat> comments now, or are you waiting for the public? I'd like to have just have questions at the moment, and then we'll come to the, the comments after the public has a chance to ask questions and, and weigh in. Uh, Ms. Rella? And Your Worship, Council may also consider uh, calling a special committee of the whole just to deal with this particular item, to give, because you don't want to ever um, put yourselves into a sense of pressure that doesn't exist, uh, and we can absolutely, if Council chooses to do that, again, uh, whatever you need to, to assist you in, this is a really important piece of work. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and especially as you're, we're getting tired and all that sort of good stuff, so um, that is always a safety valve for Council. Thank you for that, that, that wise suggestion, because it is getting late. Uh, however, we probably do have some people who would like to, to weigh in here tonight as well, so I'm going to go to Ms. Morden. Are there other people on the lines would, uh, waiting to call in? Uh, no, Your Worship, there are no calls on the line at the moment. I'm just double-checking with staff. Okay, thank you. If there are, can you just uh, catch my eye and, and we'll come back? Um, so back to this table, and Councillor Green, you had some comments? Well, thank you. I, I prepared some just in preparation for the meeting, and First of all, I, I do want to re reiterate that the uh, report and the work that staff has done is incredibly comprehensive, and the, their help today with my questions was most appreciated. Um, what I wanted to say was that public engagement opportunities in a small community are vital to the quality of decision-making at the council level. The history in Oak Bay of passionate, committed, and able volunteers who bring skills and expertise to our advisor body, advisory bodies is well recognized. At this unusual and challenging time of COVID-19 when public engagement is limited and public participation is restricted, we naturally rely more strongly on our volunteers as a way of remaining connected to our residents, and they are essentially a window into our community. And I guess the Heritage Commission in particular I chose to talk about briefly because um, I was, like, counsel, uh, like um, the mayor, I was a heritage liaison in my first term on council. I then became a member of the commission and then served as chair. So I have had a seven year history with, with heritage and I still don't know enough. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that um, the heritage commission is a really good case in point about 
dedication, and uh, it's been active since 1974. You're correct, Ms. Rella, it was created prior to that time. It was a committee, that's my understanding, and then established in 2011 as a, as a commission. Um, much of the progress, though, in Oak Bay on heritage matters can be attributed to the work of successive heritage advisory committees and commissions. Um, the, uh, in the absence of qualified professional planners in Oak Bay until 2015, which is an amazing long time, um, heritage activities and land use decisions relied on the commitment and work of the heritage volunteers. So I think that's why the shift and the anticipation around change, um, they, they have been vital to, to uh, sort of a, a, an ad hoc planning function, and I realize that, that their role has changed now as a result of having qualified planning staff, and that's a good thing. Um, but I think I, I just wanted to bring some understanding of, of where they came from. In, so um, in our effort to codify the work of volunteer advisory bodies, um, we must make sure, though, that we value and validate their work and allow them the flexibility to exercise their skills, knowledge, and expertise. And I think that's what I was referring to in the mandate section of the bylaw, where the term included implied to me that, that we could, in fact, make it a little more flexible in the mandate, allowing for, for perhaps more creative activities. Um, and then... Um, I wanted to say that the energy and commitment of heritage volunteers begins with a passion for preservation and conservation. So this commission does differ a little from the others, which are much more technically focused. The Heritage Commission is a combination of land use and passion. I think that's the best way to put it. And, um, and I think it's the passion piece that we sometimes um, have difficulty managing, um, but, I, but I think that's what makes them so creative and energetic. Um, and I think uh, the mandate can include well-established activities that continue to advance Oak Bay heritage, things like a, a community networking to identify heritage landmarks and properties worthy of registration and designation, public education and information sharing, expansion of the inventory of significant properties and landmarks through the Heritage Register, and, um, and a complementary role through collaboration with uh, building and planning staff, because I, I really want to emphasize the complementary role that really they should support each other. And, and I, think, I think planning and building do support the commission very well. Um, and s but sometimes I think maybe there are, are missed messages or missed opportunities to actually fully understand each other. And I think that's why your emphasis on understanding is important. <coughs> and finally, um, I do understand and support the need to more clearly define the roles of the Foundation and Commission to avoid some of the overlap identified in the staff memo. Um, but my question is, will shifting the community outreach activities to the Heritage Foundation and restricting the Commission's role to land use referrals? And I think we've sort of touched on that already tonight, so it may th these were written before the meeting. Um, we need to be sure that that we don't lose the meaning for the volunteers to the important aspect of, of the Commission's work. Because at the end of the day, we will not be able to recruit and retain volunteers if they don't feel their work has meaning to the municipality and to council and, and to the community. So those were the comments I prepared before the meeting. I altered some of them because you have answered some questions and clarified, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Are there any other comments on this? No, okay, I will take that. Uh, I, I guess my only comments on this are, I, uh, I, I struggle uh, with the, the wording and the pieces of it. I, I keep coming back to the pieces of what we actually can do within the Local Government Act and how creative we can be within that piece. You know, the, the requirements for calling a formal meeting and all those pieces that tie to that, that we have an obligation to if we're going to follow the trans transparency best practices. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, this is going to have to do rely heavily on the foundation for the education and the promotion, those parts of it, and uh, allow for anything that touches on council, anything that has to do with business to come through the commission, allow that that creativity to happen in the sense that they can they can own those and bring them, but 
Um, I, I just don't think we can do all the things we want to do as listed out there within the one body. I think they have to be some in the foundation and some in the, in the, com in the commission. I just don't think there's any way around that. Uh, given the structures that we have, just like this is a terrible body for being creative <laughs> and doing things. It's a, it's a stifled, it is, it's just, it's a formalized model, right? So it's hard to have them in a way that is, allows for free conversations and things and, and, and timely. So um, I, I think this is very close to, to good. I think it needs, you know, from the, the comments meet here, we have to clarify some of these little pieces uh, to make it work. I'm trying to, um, so why don't, if, I get the sense here from the uh, from the conversation that we would like to have a, a more thorough discussion on this. So really, I turn to the wisdom of, a, of the table here in terms of what you would like, how you would like to do that. Uh, Special Committee of the Whole was one suggestion put on that. Um, and so maybe that's a piece. D does the body wish to uh, refer this to the members so that it can come back in time for that? Okay, so that that changes the timeline a little bit in terms of what we can what we can do. But either way, that 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 referral will have to be there. So um, I'm trying to I'm not going to. It's just terrible at to eight ten thirty eight at night trying to come up with motions to uh, to allow this kind of thing to happen. But would the motion be here to refer to this to a um, to a future committee of the whole and to refer the draft heritage commission mandate documents to the Heritage Commission mem members for comment? Is that? Yeah. I, so I, just to be clear, we're only referring the Heritage Commission? We or? haven't discussed the other ones yet, so can we just, I think we need to yes. deal with them one at a okay. time. <laughs> well, I think we can get through the other ones reasonably. Sorry, Councillor Appleton, you had a? Well, I'm just, I'm just reading the recommended, the recommended motion, and under subsection A, it, it just indicates that Staff would circulate by email the proposed draft mandates, et cetera, et cetera, for individual comment to corporate services and report back to the committee of the whole on November the 16th. So this recommendation involves re sending it uh, to the members for comment and reporting back to committee of the whole. So if it comes back to committee of the whole, is that discussion not possible at that committee of the whole meeting? Uh, Ms. Varela? Uh, well, Your Worship, uh, the agendas now are uh, really stacking up between now and December. So given the fact that Council might want to workshop both the, the Foundation and the Heritage Commission role, I could see that being a significant item uh, that you may wish to consider on a, on a special meeting. Um, I, I would anticipate that that November 16th meeting is already loading up uh, quite quickly. So I think the motion, but your point is that there's a motion there that sort of does it. We could just take out the date and, and leave it at that. Is that? Uh, well, that, that's my question. I, I, that yeah. seems to be the way it appears to me. And, and taking Ms. Varela's comments, um, I, I don't have an issue with just removing the date and implying that that would, or, and just saying instead of report back to a special committee of the whole meeting, to be determined or whatever that language would look like. Yeah, because I would anticipate you would want a bit of a workshop. Um, this motion before the discussion tonight anticipated us just getting uh, the info information out to the members, compiling the information when it came back, and then presenting that to uh, committee the whole. But if you want to further workshop the actual um, establishing bylaws and how the foundation uh, commission are going to interface. That's a much more significant piece. That'll take a, a larger time block, Your Worship. Right, Councillor Appleton, go well, ahead. Well, then it would be acceptable just to move things along. Then for me to just make the motion uh, that, uh, well, make the make recommend move recommendation one a uh, in the staff report uh, with the amendment that uh, under subsection a direct staff to circulate by email the proposed draft mandates, duties, and composition details to the current respective advisory body volunteers for individual comment to corporate services by November the 4th, 2020, and report back to a special committee of the whole meeting uh, date to be determined. So this just, but the wording would just, we're here, here specifically the heritage uh, piece. Well, I think we, if we, I think we may have a chance to actually do all of the I think that one is very specific to heritage. Again, uh, staff will take direction if you want this referred out to each of the advisory bodies. Um, staff will implement and... That's fair enough. We can do all of them. Yeah. yeah 
if I may, Your Worship, I, I, I would concur. My understanding would be that that would include all of the advisory bodies. I, I think it would be, in my opinion, it would be challenging to refer it to one advisory body for, you know, for, well, to move that forward for specific workshopping, quote unquote, uh, and not afford that opportunity to the other advisory bodies. Um, I would anticipate that maybe their comments or their input might be somewhat more limited. I, I've got um, lots of head nodding going on, so I don't think there's any argument here. <laughs> we're, we're good on that. Yeah, thank you. Enough. Yeah. Anything else, Councilor Rafferty? No, thanks. Councilor Braithwaite? I just wonder if we still want to leave that November 4th date in, or do, they, do we need longer than that? I'm... I think you said um, yeah, by, to, that they had to have comment back November by November 4th. Is that, I, I'm not sure, d does the rest of the committee feel that that's enough time for that's, comments that's to come back? That's two weeks for, for, for members to, re to respond back. Okay. And that'll, that'll come back to that meeting. Okay. Councilor Green? Thank you, and I would also agree with Councilor Braithwaite that the others are, are straightforward. They really are. I'm not sure that we, you know, we need to um, go in great detail tonight here at this table. Um, and we're sending them out, and we're having a special council meeting, so I think that hopefully will help. I, I have no issue with that. I will just touch on them briefly before we leave, just in case there's any thing that people do have that want to flag so that uh, staff could be prepared at least for that meeting uh, if there are any. So, but we can deal with the motion here which deals with all of them to refer. I think the process would say the same either way. Um, are there any other discussions on the motion? Are we clear? Is you there a seconder? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that was our question. Oh, I'm okay, sure sorry. There was a I'll second. Move and seconded. Thank you for that. <laughs> It's a problem, sorry. I get worse at this as it goes on. So you want to call this now, I think. The, um, the, uh, so we have a motion on the table uh, as laid out there without the, uh, without the November 16th date. Um, I don't see any other discussion. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Um, I would like to just touch base on the other items that are in front of us here, though. The, um, the um, sorry, I'm going backwards the other way. The design panel pieces, are there any additional uh, special comments that people have related to the design panel changes suggested here? Not seeing any. Um, the other one is Advisory Planning Commission. This is the Land Use Advisory Planning Commission. So I had one question on here. It's just in the composition, there was uh, the, the expertise on, on heritage was out of this. And I think the intention of that being in there originally was because, uh, not because there was overlap on land use pieces, but because of all of the broader planning questions that there would be a, uh, have that lens on there. So that would, I'm just gonna flag that because I think that might be something that we want to reinstate into that, into the makeup is again, they're, they're, they're aspirational, not, not binding, but I think that they're worth having. Um, anybody else on that? Uh, not just to debate that, just I'm flagging it just for staff so they they, they have it aware. And anything on public art advisory committee? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Green. Um, I can't remember who mentioned this, but I, I've been thinking about it too, and it may have been Councillor Braithwaite, but we have no diversity on that committee, and it would be wonderful if we could include an Indigenous artist on that committee, um, because we, we do have some Indigenous art in our community, and um, so it's just just a consideration in terms of the makeup of membership. I mean, really, ideally, all of our commissions and committees should have more diversity. We just, unfortunately, don't have it right now. But I think we should have language that reflects that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comments on any of these items? Not seeing any. So that motion stands. I just I wanted to make sure we didn't... If somebody had something big that they wanted to be addressed before it came back again, I didn't want it to be brought forward at that meeting. If there's any other thoughts, though, that people have between now and the next meeting, um, by all means, you can share them with staff as well, just so that they have a chance to do some research and uh, and come back with, with answers at the meeting and not be, uh, we don't have to uh, throw around. Ms. Varela. Uh, I don't want to make an assumption, Your Worship. There is a second recommendation on the staff report about committee input and direction on the option of shifting the Heritage Foundation to a fee-for-service agreement. 
Uh, it was also requested, but we can bring that back to the future committee of the whole and we could have Christopher Payne here to talk about what that funding certainty looks like and that could give uh, council and the public a measure of comfort. Uh, thank you. I think I think it's an unfortunate term. I think that the, uh, I think, you know, something that would sound more like, you know, just co consistent direct funding of the Heritage Foundation as opposed to, because there's a, uh, what I read into the intent of that is that it funds them. They, right now they, they come and ask for different pieces. If they're doing an educational piece, they ask for f funding from the Heritage Commission. If they're doing printing of something, they, they go and ask for special funding from some source to pr for the paper to print on. It's, it's very ad hoc and very cumbersome. And as Councillor Green knows, it often goes back and forth to the Commission and the Foundation and back and forth. And really the intent there, right, as I understand it, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that that we would just fully fund their, their needs and they could go and do the work that they need to do. Is that fairly accurate? Yes, and it would also uh, mean they didn't have to apply to the grant and aid process. So again, right. you're actually giving them more funding security. Uh, a fee for service agreement is actually a formal term, so, um, but perhaps we could put some softening language around <laughs> that. But it was certainly a, a point for concern based on the, um, the correspondence that we got. So I think it's just a, a public education piece and we can tackle that at the future meeting. Okay, so there's no additional motion required. You just want to make sure that that gets brought back for conversation as well. Okay, that it should for sure. Uh, any other discussion here before we uh, sign off on this one topic? very complicated and nuanced that <laughs> culmination of a lot of work so uh, uh, thank you so much for all the work that's been done by staff it's uh, I have to admit when I read through it uh, I'm like oh yes you have been busy well over the last <laughs> last few months <laughs> getting this all together so very much appreciate the work and I, I'm very confident we'll come to something that uh, that meets the need of council and the committees and commissions and staff by the time we're all done thank you for that and with that just need a motion to adjourn Move adjournment Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Thank you very much.